Well, I, uh, we, we'll take it easy on you. We will not throw you in the air. Uh, we'll do, in fact, nothing kinetic to you, but, uh, you know, the other stuff, the ribbing. Mm, that you can know, I, can, but, I can handle that. Absolutely. I'm happy to get ribbed. Someone who can't take a little, you know, you got to have a sense of humor. And the funniest thing in the world is yourself, actually. So you got to just, you know, you got to roll with it. Well, once you learn to laugh at yourself, it's a lot easier to laugh at other people. No, that's not the message. That's not the learning. Never mind that. Uh, but Jenny, what are you going to say? I always manage to avoid that because my birth is in the summer. So I never got, you know, the thing where you had to sit down and all your classmates sing to you. Never happened because I was always out of school. And then I spent my first 12 summers at a summer camp where my mom worked and my mom said we can't really celebrate your birthday because all the other kids and so for 12 years i got packages like sneaked away but we didn't really celebrate my birthday and by the time that i thir turned 13 i didn't i didn't really care about it so it was never like a big thing to sell like to talk about my birthday but I do make jokes about the reigning royals and the ones that are like in next in line to reign over over Sweden. They have to get married on my birthday. <laughs> Apparently that's a tradition. So the royal family celebrates my birthday. And sometimes all of Sweden celebrates my birthday when it coincides with midsummers. Do they play the national anthem uh, during supper at your house, uh, Jenny? Is that how they celebrate? No, I just tell them that they have to bow down to the OG queen, and my kids know better to disobey. <laughs> my kids once asked me if I played with the dinosaurs when I was a kid, and I kind of like, first I was like, oh my god, no. And then I was like, ah, oh, I can turn this into my advantage. And I was like, yes. I did, as a matter of fact. And T-Rex is dead. And yet, here I am. Did you still want to mess with me? And my kids were like, no. And I'm like, good choice. So it's good to be able to think quickly on your feet sometimes. Yes, indeed. Well, I see that uh, your your uh, transport has arrived, Chuck. Um, so we're going to bid you adieu uh, as you sail off uh, to an, another trip around the sun. Imagine that. It's a free trip. All expenses. Well, no, that's not true. Uh, none of the expenses are paid, but you're forced to go around the sun. The same sun we all go around. Well, I guess I just overwhelmed him with that information. Uh, the obvious. The obvious got to him. That's what cracked him. It was the obvious. Restating the obvious. Anyways, uh, obviously, I'm having a good time. I hope you are all as well. Uh, it's good to be here with everybody. I'm here uh, till, I think, 7 o'clock. Uh, and so we're going to take it where it goes. I think somebody will come up and join me shortly. Uh, and looking forward to that. And wow, just like that, here she is. Prince Heather has joined. We now have full co-host chairs. So uh, watch out, everybody. And uh, I bet it's probably Heather's birthday uh, or something like that, too. A big convergence on this state. But maybe not. No, nope, no, nope, no, nope, not my birthday. Not my birthday. You're going to have to wait uh, until um, later after Yenny's. Uh, a little bit later than Yenny's. Um, and I only know that because I Googled when the Swedish royal family gets married. And <laughs> and uh, my my birthday is uh, uh, a little bit after that, but not too much farther than that. I know we have, so we have Mockers coming up. I know we have Axel coming up in the not too distant future. And then we would have Yenny and then me, and I can't remember who else. But I know they're in there. I can't remember who though. I but I know there's like one or day or so before mine. Um, and yeah, so eight days, Yenny, eight days between you and me. Um, and uh, yeah, we can we can tolerate that. And uh, you know, we don't have very many people up as speakers, so I'm gonna have to figure out something really stupid and controversial to say 
So everybody wants to come up and talk. I did that the other night. It worked really, really well. Um, and uh, so go ahead, Yenny. <laughs> well, you mentioned beaver fever. <laughs> but actually, I, what? I mentioned that I mentioned that a little bit ago, and you didn't notice. And that, but that's okay. That's okay. But yes, we can talk about beaver fever. I also think that we would probably talk about beaver fever a little bit tonight with Navo Dave because he likes all of those bugs. And yes, beaver fever is a bug, right, Yeti? Yep. 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 No, I was just gonna say that uh, Chris, Chris Windley, his birthday is before the day before mine, the 18th. And if you ever wonder why I speak so much, it's because I'm a Gemini and we start talking when we're young and we never shut up. Just saying. Okay. Now, did I find the wrong date for the royal family? What is it? The 13th or the 18th? Or the, the 19th. The 19th. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you are closer than I thought than me to be. That That is, yeah. I am. I am, I still don't know what I am and I don't put, you know, stock into the astrology thing anyway. Um, and because it look, it depends on what you look at. It depends on what chart you look at, what newspaper you look at. Sometimes I'm a Gemini, sometimes I'm a Cancer because I was born on the cusp. No, I'm, I'm a Gemini. I don't put too much stock into it. Although sometimes I... I look at the description and I'm like, <laughs> that is me. <laughs> but I think it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So, you know, like you see it in your, then you're like, oh, I can continue to act this way, even though it's kind of being an a-hole because yeah, yeah, I can yeah. just blame it on the stars. So, yeah. So we're <laughs> only three days apart then because I'm the 21st. So, yeah. It's, it's not too bad. Then we've got to run. Chris Windley, you, me. Um, so, yeah, that's that's not necessarily a bad thing. Now, is anybody asking themselves what on earth is beaver fever? James, do you know what beaver fever is? Uh, I believe that came from uh, one of the bio labs, if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> I would love if it came from one of the bio labs, but I discovered beaver fever. Um, in a search the other night um, to make sure I was spelling a a bug correctly and discovered a new <laughs> state of New York state of New York document warning people about beaver fever. And since then I have I have gained more knowledge and evidently it is this this has been very well known as beaver fever in the United States or in North America for an extremely long time. Beaver fever is what may also be known as Giardia, a uh, something, a really nasty bug that you can pick up. Um, and evidently beavers carry this quite frequency, frequent, frequently, so it is known as um, beaver fever. Um, it's more annoying than, it's not really deadly, it's, or dangerous it's just really annoying to you know have the gastrointestinal distress of giardia which is also known as beaver fever and i have continued to call it beaver fever because well jenny and i have sense of humor of 12 year old boys right jenny 100 percent. i wish i could say they're like certain jokes i just that will never stop being funny it's um one of them is you can fit 63 earths in uranus because the Earth is that much smaller than the other planets. I know. It's, it's like, today is not the day that I don't find that funny. But And then there's uh, 64 if you relax. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Um, and I will say, um, if you look for inappropriate children's bedtime stories, um about beavers on amazon or on youtube you will find a wealth of humor um and <laughs> and it will lead you to uh, other things that that will also make you laugh so let's get off the beaver fever why did i 
Why am I so obsessed with Beaver Fever? Obsessed with Beaver Fever because of the massive floods that are happening all over Russia. And when you look at that much water in a place, um, you get concerned about the diseases that are going to spread um, because of that. Now, I know cholera will be an issue. I know beaver fever may be an issue. Um, I, I, you know, so so that's, that is why it's not unrelated to what is happening. And the floods in Russia are rather amusing since one of them was started by a beaver. Uh, that was definitely a biolab beaver. And, uh, and they're having issues with beavers trying to build dams in the flooded areas also. And, uh, well, it's not really issues. I guess there are people who are literally watching the beavers and cheering them on and hoping that they do a good job because clearly Russia cannot do a good job of building a dam. Right there, James? Uh, apparently not. They use styrofoam, I understand, in the middle. Uh, and uh, if mice can chew through it, well, it's not a good sign, is it? Because beaver are much better equipped in the tooth department. Well, yes, yes. And they have to try to um, block some of them up with concrete blocks, but those seem to float away. Yeah, you know, we did find a, um, Mockers did find an image of a uh, submerged skate park where you could see the top of, of the, you know, the skate ramps out of the water. And I suggested they install diving boards and just make a great recreation area out of that. But what ended up happening in the long run, is those ramps ended up floating away because they obviously were not constructed correctly. So this also then leads me to the uh, the coat pyramids. The coat pyramids. What good are the coat pyramids if they're made so shoddily? Which I I I think that they are. That they can be floated away. Um. Yeah, they can be moved very easily, I believe. Um, I think you, that uh, Ukraine is doing a much better job. I know they are putting in some lines similar. And Ukraine, I am sure, has built these to spec that they are heavy and they are installing them correctly, which, you know, makes a huge difference. Yenny, please go ahead. Well, not only the dam was crap, but, you know, I... I don't know what kind of concrete they have that floats. The Swedish one sings like a rock. So, you know, they, they, they're doing something very, very wrong. Now, if they build it in the, the shape of anything that is, you know, has a concavity in it, right, uh, then it can float. And in fact, that was one of the strategies during World War II for landing some of the what would be docks, on, uh, you know, during D-Day. And uh, they sunk them and they were made of concrete. So that can work. But I think when you build a dam, you try to avoid that design on purpose. And uh, but but maybe they couldn't get the best engineers in the world to uh, work on these dams, um, or maybe they ran out of money because um, you know pockets, deep pockets. Yes, these are all possible things. I see Ghost of Mister M has his hand up. Please go ahead, there, scary ghost. Yes, good evening, everybody, and good evening, James. Good evening, Prince. Uh, about the concrete, uh, maybe they just use uh, very bad concrete uh, because of the corruption. That is my thought. Sorry, James, go ahead. Nope, nope, nope. You, you said it. You said it. Yeah, I think that's about right. Um, yeah, one way or the other, uh, the right ingredients didn't get mixed in there. Um, something was too expensive, so they probably substituted with, I'm thinking, mud. We know that uh, the Drangheta and uh, the Mafia uh, in Italy, Italia, they uh, used uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, bad concrete 
to build uh, some things. Uh, they get uh, some contracts from the government and they build some things and they were very, very bad. And I think that it's uh, the same way in uh, Russia because uh, Russia is also a land of corruption. Uh, everybody bribes uh, the other one uh, to get the permits, uh, the security guarantees. Uh, it isn't uh, like we have in Europe uh, some good institutes and uh, that control these things uh, that is not in russia in russia is uh, corruption a very big thing absolutely I've not... yep, sorry james go ahead no 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 you started first i i jumped in too late go ahead no 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 and then that's exactly what i think i think that they you know, they just are not, they just are not using, I mean, obviously, if the concrete is floating away, they have messed up in the formula for making concrete. Now, I believe concrete has been around for a while, and it should be pretty well known how to make this stuff. Concrete, I don't believe should float. And, and so, yeah, so that's just, that's just what I'm saying there. Um, and, uh, and, and I do not mind um, the entertainment that is provided from the from the um, massive flooding all over Russia because you know there's nothing better late in my evening. That's actually early in my morning, just because the way my day goes, I consider evening until three a.m. Um, and I, I, you know, I'm watching videos of rushing water in the rooftops of the rooftops of houses and then all of a sudden just gently gen gently rolling along in the wa water is an outhouse and it's just like yeah you see it's just it's just this it's just something that makes me laugh so anyway um you all have to deal i guess with my crazy humor especially since yenny is up and uh, we um, just don't get box wide. If box wide comes up, then we will be lost forever because she'll try to talk me into eating sardines and chocolate at the same time. And that is just sick, twisted and wrong. Um, but that's a whole nother story. So, you know, everybody, I don't know. I don't know what happened in those five hours that I slept and, and the few things that I've done um, that have kept me busy since I woke up. Um, I don't know how much has been talked about Israel at the moment. I will share that. I do know that there is a UN security council meeting happening about this. I don't know that anything will come from it. The things that I have heard basically is that people are going to generally support Israel, but are not going to like go and do any offensive attacks on Iran. I have also heard, and I don't know if anybody can confirm this or deny it, but I have also heard that um, Israel isn't going to retaliate immediately, which I, I don't know. I, you know. I don't know the area well enough other than to know that um, last night I was rather upset. I was rather mad. I understand it a little bit better today, and I am still not happy. But I, I get the concept a little bit better. and. And so what I was angry about last night was, you know, this, this huge barrage of drones and missiles being shot at Ukraine, at, at, I'm sorry, at Israel. And the allies, such as the British, the Jordanians, the French, the United States, jumping in, putting their, putting their planes in the air and shooting down not a small number of, of these um, drones, especially, and missiles. And it's like, why couldn't you do that for Ukraine? You have assets in Poland. You have assets in, I believe, the Baltics. You have assets in Romania. Why couldn't you have done that? So does anybody get the difference? I mean, I, I get it now after hearing you who to talk about this last night. Um, does anybody get the difference of why they intervened in Israel 
instead of uh, intervening in Ukraine, why they're not intervening in Ukraine the same way? Well, you know, Sorry. my take, yeah, sure. I, uh, my take was that this is um, because basically uh, this is um, what is doable. Uh, we're, we're not sure about Iran's nuclear capacity. We're pretty sure about Russia's. Uh, and so I think people are less willing to do this. And the narrative, uh, you know, about um, the NATO group, I think, uh, you know, wanting to be uh, fighting Russia, want, you know, pushing Ukraine into this, that kind of thing, uh, would be supported if we started to do that. And it also would literally make us combatants in the war. And uh, I think I think that's, um, you know, that's a serious issue to think about, but I don't know that that's the reason. This is me speculating, not a military guy, not an international lawyer either. Yeah, it's frustrating, but um, yeah, that's that, that's not exactly it. But um, I, but that's that's good. I mean, I, I get it. I get it. I am so frustrated still that that the United States and the other allies are not helping to shoot down these missiles and drones over Ukraine. Um, but Yeni, go ahead. I I get it, but at the same time, I'm still. I'm still disappointed. Not the not that they're not flying in Ukraine and closing the skies of Ukraine. <clears throat> that part I don't mind. You know, like I that part I get. The part that disappoints me is they rallied and closed the skies and helped shoot down the missiles and everything over Israel. Awesome. Ukraine never asked for the, uh, their allies to risk their lives. They just said, give us the weapons and we'll get the job done. Which means that we don't have to risk our own soldiers. We just need to equip them. That must, in a way that it feels cheaper. If, if you don't want to give it to them, if you don't want to donate the stuff, lend it to them and then if it breaks it breaks you know it's kind of like if your buddy borrows your car and then they hit an ice patch and they have a horrible crash it's not like you're gonna sue your friend you you're just gonna write it off and do the insurance thing you're not gonna force your friend to pay anything so can we do that can we lend stuff to them? Because we all have surplus in our storages. There has got to be something where we can give them, just give them the equipment to get the job done. And they have proven themselves to be quite competent, to be really good soldiers. They have proven that it is the fight in the dog, not the dog in the fight that counts. At the end of the day, they have better training apparently granted that they have home court advantage but they have used the stuff exemplary so why can't we just do that why can't we do that that was the part that disappointed me the most well Thank we you. have laws on our side that just prevent that. It requires Congress at this point to do something. Uh, there's not much, you know, not much the president can do except illegally, and they've been waiting for him to slip up. So I don't think he's going to do that. But anyways, we have a plethora of hands, Prince, uh, practically a plethora. Uh, Michael, hello, welcome. I don't believe we've met, but good to have you here. Uh -huh. Hello, everybody. I want to ask you, answer yourself. If is Ukraine betrayed by the West or not? Is it true the pressure from Exxon Mobil and uh, and the other company trading with uh, Kazakhstan by? Uh, uh, Transnift, Russian Transnift, 
via Novorossiysk transport po port for crude oil. Is that true? Thank you. Well, there is certainly a lot of pressure um, <clears throat> on uh, on Ukraine to not strike refineries anymore. So uh, I do not understand fully what the motivation is. I, I bet you listened to both the speaker, or I'm sorry, Secretary Austin, and to uh, the Undersecretary, uh, Ms. Wallander. And uh, if you didn't, I can recap those. Did, did you hear what they said about it? No comment. I have uh, from I have some I information from intelligence, and I don't want to go go deep in, into that. Uh, well, we don't want you to either. Let me let me quickly recap what first uh, Secretary Austin said. He said um, that <coughs> pardon me that the um, the strikes would have a knock on effect on the international oil market. Um, and that, uh, frankly, he said, frankly, uh, that Ukrainians are better off pursuing um, tactical victory within uh, Ukraine, which is very strange since we're not supplying weapons. So that was a completely tone deaf comment, in my opinion. Sounded like it was reading off a script. Uh, Ms. Wallader came up and said that uh, these are not well, essentially, and please correct me um, as if I misspeak, um, that these are not military targets. They're owned by private people within Russia. Yes, they're oligarchs. And yes, all the oligarchs are oligarchs because of the state letting them be that. But that, again, completely tone deaf argument. Uh, and I think they missed the, the main thing is that uh, refineries aren't aren't uh, stopping the crude from growing out. And if the crude goes out of Russia and they sell it uh, on the international market, it should reduce the prices because it will increase the supply. And so where's the harm in that, I ask. So Michael, that that is sort of um, a quick summary of what they said. I hope I got that accurately. Uh, but uh, what you're talking about, um, I think, <clears throat> I think it's entirely possible there's undue influence from um, people who shouldn't just should not have a voice in it. But uh, that's my take. It's not facts. Uh, I appreciate your question. Um, and I also appreciate you really probably don't want to give away any kind of secret stuff. So, uh, but Michael, any follow up to that? Uh, is there any connection uh, with Exxon, Exxon Mobile and? Uh... And Biden, Trump, uh, Transneft, Kazakhstan, Burisma Holdings. I uh, I do not know the answer to your questions. I don't think that Biden. Uh, oh, is really? Kick back. Ta type in, type in Google. Will. Type Michael? in Google hang and ask, ask hang some. Hang. Okay, but hang on there. I'll I'll let you speak here in a second, but. Uh, there's been no evidence, and they've been looking for a long time um, at Mr. Biden and his son, Hunter Biden, for a long time. And, uh, you know, Junior, uh, Hunter, that is, is uh, is apparently agreed to a, a deal with the prosecutor, and he's going to prison for a long time, it looks like, for what I regard as not very big crimes, but that's the nature of things. Um, on the other hand, they've been digging into this Burisma stuff, and the evidence is really shaky because it was based on uh, Russian uh, intelligence officers, um, So, which is not really very solid evidence, to be sure. So, uh, Michael, I'm not aware of any ties uh, to Biden. Now, the other, the other parts of that, uh, it, it, that's a different question. So I, I'm gonna, um, I am going to bet that our friend Dryfly knows a lot more about this. He's been in um, as, associated industries and knows quite about this stuff. So he may have a better idea than I do, Michael. Uh, so if you can bear with us um, for a little bit, maybe we can go to hands. And uh, Jenny, I think you had your hand up first though. So no, actually, let's, James, let's go let's to Dryfly. Yeah, let's go to Dryfly. Excellent. So I think Yenny will understand. Go ahead, Jen. Go ahead, Dryfly. 
Yeah, I'm not going to get involved in the conspiracy theories. That's just stuff that's been floating around. It's mostly Russian talking points um, fed through the Republican Party to get at Biden um, for the most part. Is there were there connections with Exxon and, and Russian oil? Yeah, sure. Every Western oil company had connections with Russian oil going back before the war. I mean, it was just there was a huge amount of development and uh, cooperation leading up to what, 2016, 2015, after the initial uh, Crimean attack, most of those ties were starting to be cut. Uh, After this go around in 2022, almost all of them were cut. There are still a few like the French company Schlumberger who are into their eyeballs in, in Russia, but most of them have left and have taken huge losses, massive losses. The reason they aren't going after the refineries, I'm guessing, is that uh, they don't want to have a a pressure on the distillates market in places like Europe and in the Middle East. And I think they're wrong. Um, it's still on the table. The threat is there. The demonstration of the capability has been made. Russia knows it's a real threat. So that hasn't gone away. Um, what will be done about it in the months to come? I have no idea, but I'm not I'm, I'm not buying into the conspiracy theories on any of that. I think the paranoia on the part of the, or worry on the part of the White House is far, far more basic than that. They don't want to have to explain price increases to the population during an election year. I mean, the election is going to be tight enough as it is. And so they absolutely don't want unnecessary pressures. And I can tell you 100% for sure that if you bust up the Middle East, okay, um, oil is going to go through the roof. I mean, the Straits of Hormuz, 25% of the world's oil goes to the Straits of Hormuz. You shut that down, and Iran could shut it down tomorrow. They could shut it down now if they wanted to, because all it takes is anti-ship missiles. Um, we've had Malcolm Nance on this site discuss that. We've had Gunny discuss that. There is no way a Navy can keep that straight open, period, end statement. There's nothing we could do. We would have to have a land war in Iran, push them back far enough so that the sea launch missiles couldn't affect shipping through the Straits of Hormuz. And who's prepared to have a land war in Iran? I mean, it would make Iraq and Afghanistan look like holidays. So there are are real constraints on what the U.S. and the West can do with respect to Iran. So, yeah, are they walking carefully? They're damn right they're walking carefully because right now Iran holds the trump card. Now, could we, and I meant that not as a pun, but, you know, in the the literal sense. Um, Now, is there anything we could do? Yeah, sure. We could do to them what... Uh, what Ukraine is threatening to do to Russia, eliminate their domestic refining capacity. If you wanted to take down the Iranian government and completely collapse it, you do the same thing that we've discussed doing to Russia. You take out their refining capacity. There is no modern country that can operate without oil and gas at the commercial level. They just can't. There's just no possible way. So if you were to take out the domestic refining capacity of Iran, you would bring them to their knees. But you do that, you're going to be in a long, long dragged out war, at least until the, the, their regime collapses. And no one's looking for that. That doesn't help anyone. It doesn't help uh, Israel. It doesn't help the U.S. It doesn't help the Western countries. Um, it, it, it doesn't even necessarily help the Iranians who are, you know, advocating for regime change because it would be so disruptive and so destructive. So everybody's looking for some alternative other than that to get us through this period into a stability without going completely draconian. And so I'm not criticizing the White House for doing what they're doing. I'm criticizing them for not sharing with us the real risks. That's my biggest complaint. Tell us what the problems are. Tell us what you're really worried about. And by the way, I do not believe it's nuclear. I think nuclear is a threat, but it's it's farther down the list than having the energy cut off to Europe and North America. And they really could. It wouldn't just be Exxon losing a little bit of profit. It would be the whole economies of Western Europe, North America, and much of developed parts of Asia just absolutely taking it on the chin. So, I mean, people should really be a little more appreciative of the real risks. I think they're going to have to do something. We still may face that. But I really find it really almost comical 
with some of the comments on Twitter about, you know, the macho stuff about, oh, we should show them how tough we are and deterrence and all this. There is deterrence, but a lot of deterrence requires you taking one hell of a punch too, okay? And are we prepared for that? Some are, but as divided as the U.S. is, divided as Europe, how quickly do you think the Europeans would cave and demand that Ukraine give up? Or in North America, that we cave and that we give in to whatever the Iranians are asking? I mean, I think it would be damn fast if we had a 1973 like oil embargo. And this would actually be worse than that. It'd be much, much worse than that. So, I mean, I think people just got to take a deep breath and, and realize that there are some forces out there that are bigger than the White House. They're bigger than the EU. They're bigger than NATO. They're bigger than anything Russia can do. Russia's just riding the wave. Um, so I think we just all have to take a deep breath. And at the same time, communicate with our elected officials on what are demands of the outcome. I call my senators, I call my representatives, and, and, and I speak to people constantly about we have to demand what we expect the end game to look like. It's up to them to get us to that point because they're the ones that have the intel. They're the ones that have the resources. But we have to tell them what we expect. I expect Ukraine to be a free country with their, with their uh, borders returned without the fear of Russia hanging over their head. And I expect us to help them get there. I expect Israel to be a free country. I expect them to respect world order, and, I, and they will. There may be some regime change required in Israel as well. That's for them to decide who to replace some of the bad actors with. But my expectation is that they will in time. And we have to have a humane treatment of people who are not in harm's way or who are in harm's way, but aren't, aren't combatants and not just drag everybody down the rabbit hole over ego and over the immediate knee jerk response to quote, retaliate. I, I just think we need to have good leadership. Are we getting it? Some, not enough. I think we need to get a lot more of it. And that's why we need to be active at the, at the polling place and at the, uh, uh, you know, with our, with our correspondence with our elected officials. But anyone thinks this is going to be easy, that this is going to be some time, you know, wave a magic wand and this stuff all goes away, or there's some simple conspiracy theory answer. I, I think they're just smoking the good stuff. And I don't think they're, they're paying attention to what reality is. There are some tough, tough choices. And I'm not saying everybody's perfect. I'm not saying every one of those people are innocent uh, of every single uh, piece of corruption. But I'm saying that the conspiracy theories are way overblown. The problems are real and they're significant and we need to overcome them. And I'll listen. Thanks, Drive. Well, I appreciate that very much. Uh, interesting. Uh, and uh, I think, Jenny, you're next. And then we'll get back to you, Michael. Thank you for that dry fly. Um, all I was going to say is all of the allies <clears throat> let Ukraine down. I wasn't talking about a specific country. I know that my country can do more. We can deliver more. We have more. And Spain can give up. They can place another order or have the EU and have the EU pay for it for Patriot systems. They're not even close to being invaded by anyone much at the very least is Russia. So they could give up their patriots and just transfer them over to Ukraine. Do what Denmark did. They gave up all their artillery because they had an order and there were new ones coming in. I'm pretty sure Spain can do the same with their patriot systems. So it's not one specific country. It's all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. I, I think there's much truth in this, that we all have some uh, responsibility. And uh, people, um, yeah, they've disappointed. I'm going to say disappointed rather than um, betrayed. Uh, they certainly did disappoint Ukraine because they are not getting the aid that they need. And uh, we could have probably ramped up a lot sooner. And even once the starting gun went off back in 22, uh, we should have ramped up a lot sooner then. We should have done it way before, but here we are. So uh, let's see here. Um, Michael, back to you. And oh, by the way, Rex Tillerson was Secretary of State um, in, under uh, the in the Trump administration, and he had received uh, the Order of Friendship uh, from Russia. So he was 
Um, definitely tied in, but as was stated earlier, um, everybody, every company was tied in. Anybody with as much oil as Russia is going to have uh, business partners, uh, big business partners. But go ahead, Michael. Thank you for waiting. Uh, so uh, for the beginning, I want to say I'm not an, uh, I, I'm not on, on any uh, politi political side. Uh, I'm a politician. Uh, what I want to say it's like um, want to say it bad. Uh, shit hits the fan, and 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 the case uh, goes out. Uh, anybody who speak uh, Ukrainian is uh, like. Uh, uh, I I've sent on your like a message uh, side interview with one Ukrainian uh, journalist and he explained everything what what is going on and this is looking really really bad. It's not about Democrats Republicans. Uh, it's nothing like that. It's, it it looks really bad. But for West, thank you. Well, Ukraine is certainly in a bad position without the armaments that the United States possesses, and that has been um, we we've got a bill that would give sixty one billion dollars, which would not quite double what we've or not quite match what we've given previously, uh, which I believe is somewhere like around seventy nine billion dollars. Um, up through the July um, PDA disbursement. So we, we've given a lot um, and uh, we're ready. We have a bill waiting. Um, we have to go around the speaker to get there. So we're asking everyone to call their representatives and ask them to sign this discharge petition that will get it around the speaker and allow it to get to the floor for a vote. And so at that point, the United States should be able to resume uh, delivering aid to Ukraine. Uh, it's been a long time coming. We have one of the most painful political processes, it feels like to me, uh, in the world. But I, I suppose other people could say the same thing. So, but I understand Ukraine doesn't care about our politics, but uh, that's that's what's going on here. We're waiting on people uh, to sign that discharge petition, and then it, once it gets to the floor, we'll be waiting for them to vote on this. And uh, this is a package that aids Taiwan, Ukraine, and Israel, and also benefits uh, Gaza with humanitarian aid. Uh, and uh, that's an important consideration of all all of this because part of the upsetness in the Middle East is around the treatment of uh, of Gaza, uh, whether that's there really is a deep problem there or not. Clearly they're they're hurting, but I from you know from where is that hurt coming? Well, anyways, that's another question. But uh, I hope that helps to address the issue. But I don't I don't think we're we need to look for a conspiracy either to understand that oil uh, really rules the world in terms of being the critical uh, stuff that everything runs on, uh, at least for now. Um, now, after I'm dead, uh, and uh, but less than 50 years from now, we'll have to worry about um, not having enough oil. But let's go back to dry fly, dry fly. Yeah, the other thing I wanted to bring up too is everyone's venting about um, how Israel gets special treatment and uh, Ukraine doesn't. I, I all 100% agree, Ukraine needs to get more. I've been pushing like crazy for that. But understand the scope of the problem. And the scope is pretty simple. Ukraine is the size of Texas, okay? Israel is smaller than the metropolitan area of Houston, okay? So if you were, or, or for example, it's smaller than uh, Kiev, Alba, uh, Kiev uh, Oblast. So if you were to impose the two, uh, by the way, someone's got a uh, hot mic. Yes, that's Michael. I took care of it. Go ahead, dry fly. Sorry. Thank you. Um, anyway, the deal is, is that uh, in that particular um, comparison, I mean, it's 
Israel's like a postage stamp where all the missiles are barreling in on one target, okay? It, we have access to that target because we have ships in the Mediterranean right off the coast. Um, we have an enormous level of sophisticated air defense all around the Persian Gulf. And I know that because I've actually flown in and out of that area and talked to guys, American contractors who were putting in putting it in. This was before any of this kicked off. You know, we're talking 2014, about the time the, the little green men were active in Crimea. I remember being on a plane flying out of Riyadh, and the guy was that I was sitting next to was a contractor for a U.S. defense company. He wouldn't tell me anything except that he was, quote, making the air defense system fully compatible to U.S. standards. That was back in 2015, okay? So <laughs> they've been spending some time thinking about this. This isn't something that they just threw up at the last minute as an idea. This wasn't something that the White House got together and said, oh, I know, why don't we put up an air defense system around Israel and the Persian Gulf? They have been doing this for a while, okay? And it's absolutely easily accessible to the U.S. because almost all of it can be reached by ocean, which means our naval assets can, can come here and there and do whatever they want, whether it's F-16s or whatever the Navy flies off of their carriers, F-35s, all of that stuff, it can all go up pretty fast, pretty easy. Compare that into a tiny area, okay? Now compare that with um, Ukraine, which is massive. And we have allies, we have support, we have assets, but they're way on the eastern side. And a couple of them are in countries that we don't even get along with that well, Hungary and Slovakia. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just an enormously challenging problem. For, for the U.S. to be able to, to completely do it. Now, should we do more? Hell yeah, lots more. And there's a lot more we can do. And there's probably more that Biden can do. Um, but the point is, is that it's, it's hard to compare the two situations. It's really, really hard to compare the two situations. And the biggest one is that if the Middle East blows up, Ukraine loses too. Because once oil goes to pieces, all the support, that's in Europe is going to evaporate. It's just going to be gone in a heartbeat. Most of it in the U.S., which is already challenged, it's going to be gone in a heartbeat. You're not going to have any help from Asia because everybody's economy is going to be just gasping. So there are situations that we have to be aware of as allies of Ukraine and, and, and have a bigger brief. And thankfully, it appears that the governments of the West kind of understand that. <clears throat> they're not doing things that I would do, but then I'm not, I'm not getting access to their intel. But the reality is, is that we can't let that blow up there because if it does, not only do we destroy uh, the Middle East as far as an economic engine, we actually stick another dagger in Ukraine. I mean, it, it wasn't an accident that Putin activated his proxies in that part of the world. It was not something that he just woke up one morning and thought, you know, that'd be a good idea. That was something that they most likely had on the table for a very, very long time as a fallback at some given time in in, in the conflict with the, with the West. So I, I think we just all need to take a deep breath and double down on our resolve to support Ukraine, to support our allies, and to push our governments to do the right thing and to understand when it hurts because it hasn't started to hurt the West yet. But boy, is it going to, if the oil gets shut off in that part of the world, we have no idea what the hurt's going to be like. And anyone who went through the oil embargo has just a taste of what it's going to be like. So I just think we need to take a deep breath and I will listen. Thank you. Thanks, Dryfly. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, words of wisdom, I think, because we, uh, we do not want oil shocks to ripple through our economy. Um, it doesn't help any incumbent uh, in, in the West or, frankly, in any democracy. Uh, everybody, you know, it's like, blame the current guy. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Really, that's not the way to go. Um, you know, the blame is, uh, is on Russia and Iran and North Korea. And who am I missing? Anyways, uh, you know, the, the uh, various uh, terrorist groups that are supported by Iran and uh, I think indirectly by Russia, I think. Uh, so yes, we, we should wait. And I do appreciate the timing of events that are coming out of um, Israel 
in terms of not rushing. So, for example, um, you know, they put off uh, any strike into Rafa until after Ramadan. And uh, they're they're kind of not rushing in, you know, which is a good sign. And I think that, uh, you know, taking the time, choosing the time to strike is the right way to go about it. But nobody's going to put boots on it. Well, nobody's going to put uh, conventional boots on the ground in Iran. Uh, That just isn't going to happen. It it would be a stupid thing to do. And uh, I don't think anybody's stupid enough to fall for that. But I think there'll be some, um, oh, let's call it feedback given to Iran one way or the other, uh, perhaps by way of proxies, uh, perhaps uh, they'll just wait until things are uh, finished up with Hamas and then and then do something. But uh, I don't think that uh, anybody is going to go and uh, knowingly uh, rock the oil boat because, um, yeah, I think I think the leadership uh, of the West. Oh, I should I said it again of democracies do understand uh, that stability is definitely um, in our best interest. Um, so it's it's a fine uh, line to walk, though. So appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so- we we drifted we drifted from my original question. Very interestingly here, though, um, the United States has said it will take no offensive action against Iran. So I'm not worried about that. I don't think the United States is going to go and bomb Iran. But why did they shoot down? these missiles and drones yesterday and they won't do that for Ukraine. Here's the answer. Are there any United States air bases in Ukraine? Okay, because Russia borders right with Ukraine, right? So those missiles come directly from Russia into Ukraine or Russian occupied territory into Ukraine. And there are no Russia, there are no United States air bases, and I'm, I'm using the United States specifically because I know that the best, in that area. When you look at the situation and look at the map of Iran and Israel, the distance between the two, the countries where those missiles and drones need to fly over have U.S. air bases. They have U.S. military installations. So as they are flying over those areas, the United States will take them down. That is part of the reason, a great part of the reason, why the United States, Britain, France, Jordan, because they were in Jordan's airspace, all worked to take these down last night. But since there's no flyover of the missiles or drones of a United States air base, I I will take a little bit of exception here in a minute. That is why the United States isn't, that, that is why the United States isn't doing it for Ukraine. The only exception may be the few times, and and they are not. I mean, considering the amount of times that missiles and drones have flown into Ukraine, it is not a large percentage. There have been a few times, I believe, where it has breached Romanian airspace, and the United States does have a base in Romania. Um, And and Poland. Poland also. But these, these missiles and drones are not flying over airspace on a regular basis, that have United States assets in them. And that is the difference of why they immediately took their fl- their planes up and shot these things down on their way to Israel, because there were U.S. bases and U.S. personnel in the flyover countries. That doesn't happen with Ukraine. And so that is the difference. Do I like it? No, I hate it. I hate it. I would love for for our airplanes, the United States, Romania, Poland, any of the other, you know, NATO countries to be up in the air shooting down these missiles and things like that. I hate that that's the fact, but that is the fact of what the difference is between why we did last night and why we don't eat with Ukraine. It sucks. I hate it. But that it's a logical explanation to me also. 
Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. What do you think of that, James? I think that's about accurate. You know, the, it's been clear that um, Ukraine airspace is not a place that anybody wants to take uh, their air force, you know, outside of Ukrainians. And uh, even they don't want to fly in that airspace. It's dangerous. Uh, it's not under anyone's friendly control. Uh, Russia doesn't control it exactly either, but there, it's just not a friendly place to be. And um, and for the risk of, uh, you know, what what we see is that they're, um, they would perhaps be considered as combatants at that point. And uh, is that something that we want to mess with, that kind of special, uh, you know, uh, item from the UN Charter, Article 51, that allows us to provide weapons without being a direct combatant, has some value to it. And uh, I don't think that, uh, for the most part, people want to upset that apple cart at all. So I appreciate what you're saying. Um, yes, but it would be very sweet if they did that. Uh, but I think the kind of missiles that they'd have to launch to get across Ukraine and get it across in time probably don't exist. I mean, yeah, they can go that far, but to get there fast enough to shoot down some of the hypersonics, probably not. Uh, but it, would it drag them into the war? It might. So anyway, uh, I think I think this is a good exploration of the reasoning. Uh, it isn't very uh, nice to hear, but there's a difference between um, good and what feels good. And I think this is a case where maybe everybody is um, is doing the right thing uh, doing the good thing it just doesn't feel very good and it feels like uh, ukraine is being left out um yeah to swing in the wind and that is a very sad statement so there is no doubt though about the idea that ukraine needs more aid they need it as soon as they can get it and uh, we should be fighting to uh, speed things up and that means pressuring uh, you know, you can pressure Joe Biden, but really Congress also needs to step up. And uh, this discharge petition and Senate Bill 815 are absolutely the uh, best tools and the fastest way for us to get aid to Ukraine and to Israel and to Taiwan and even to Gaza. So uh, it's about uh, stability and uh, supporting democracy. And this is the best path forward. So I hope, um, you know, I hope they don't uh, dilly dally around other topics, which we can, we know what they are, Prince, don't we? We know that they're going to talk about various topics other than that before they come and uh, sign up. So hopefully our pressure uh, on these people, reminding them that, hey, look, see, we don't we have to defend democracy everywhere, not just pick one spot. Uh, that should be a winning argument with these people. They should understand it. Uh, and uh, it keeps us out of the uh, way of fire. So anyways, Prince, um, I, <clears throat> I think uh, we've got more hands, which is a good problem. Yes, it is. Michael, go ahead. Mr. Biden says something like, uh, we support Ukraine, iron cloud, right? And now Ukraine is experiencing almost blackout. They have no air defense right they have no ammo right if i if i'm wrong tell me i'm wrong thank you they're running low on all counts so you're close to right it's not that they have none they're running very low and it's a it is a very dangerous situation so i basically you're right i just wanted to quibble that much But it's a quibble because they really do need more. They need more uh, patriots. And uh, we we are in the United States. I don't know if patriots are in the package. Prince, maybe dry fly, maybe one of you to know what is in this uh, $61 billion aid package for Ukraine. I know that they are talking about some air defense. So I believe that uh, some of that is in there. 
I assume that that is more uh, munitions for the Patriot system, uh, as well as perhaps more for the Hawk system, which one of those is shipped. I'm surprised uh, they haven't sent more of those units because, well, they're not going to take down the hypersonics and some of the other missiles. I think they would be useful nonetheless. I hear there's 10,000 of those rounds somewhere uh, that would definitely come in handy. Uh, but I don't know what's all in the package. Do you, Prince? Well, what is in the package is money for them to decide what to send, right? So yeah, that, I mean that that's that's it. I I I don't think that. I yes, I'm sure that they are thinking more ammunition, more more um more shells. I'm sure that they are thinking more missiles for the Patriot. I'm sure that they are thinking more missiles for the for you know beans. Well, not beans. They're bullets, bullets and ammo. You know what does what does Will say? A certain number of ammunition every single freaking week or whatever however frequently he says that is what ukraine needs in in order for them for the united states to be able to provide that when we're talking specifically about the united states this funding bill has to be passed so that there is money for that to happen right so we can send more equipment when this money is passed i don't think that there is anything specific in there but i do believe it is safe to assume that there will be missiles for the Patriots, missiles for other air defense systems, and there will be a lot of shells and a lot of bullets. And those, a lot of munitions, a lot of the things that they need. And, and I think that's just that's just an obvious fact, right? Um, so I'd like to go to Mary. She's had her hand up for a little bit. Um, Mary, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to say, I think um, when it comes to why we saw all of the allies um, engaging last night. It has to look or has to do with, um, sorry for any background noise, I'm with my son who has autism and he likes to express himself with lots of grunts and- and Tell him hello. <laughs> Tell him um, hello because I, yeah, that's great. Just like Napo Dave said, so. Um, but um, it has to do with the terrible wording of the Budapest memorandum versus the security agreements that we have with Israel. If you go back and look at all of the agreements we they have with Israel versus what we have with Ukraine, um, I think that's what it boils down to. Um, and then, like you said, uh, Prince, as well, um, Jordan has said that they will shoot down anything that comes into their airspace. That just flat out whether it's from Israel or from Iran. Um, so, but when it comes to UK and America and, you know, France or whoever else, I honestly just think it has to do with the wording of the security agreements and what they're willing to do. So sadly, I think that's where we are. Um, I, I wish that wasn't the case. But, uh, so keep keep calling your representatives to get them to sign discharge petition number nine so that they can get the aid because Ukraine needs all the funding it can get and we have to do more everybody. So keep the, those phone call coming. I'm gonna, do I sound like CC a little bit? Um, That's okay, I, yeah. And, uh, and and seriously, give your son a high five, give him a fist bump, give him whatever is good for him. And I realize that may just be a <laughs> random person on the internet says, hey, dude. But oh, yeah. no, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. But thanks, everyone. And uh, love y'all. Listen to y'all all the time. So uh, thank you. All right. Thanks for the input. It's all good stuff. Appreciate it very much. Um, Michael, go ahead. Can I ask you, when was last aid from US and Europe to Ukraine? Thank you. Uh, July of 23 was the last disbursement uh, under the PDA from the United States. Uh, there was a tiny, tiny, like $130 million allocated for the Hawk system, uh, the, <clears throat> and that was delivered more recently than that. But that's 
that's like a, you know, a day's drop in the bucket uh, compared to the need. So I'd say that really the sub- last substantive delivery from the United States, I would say July of 23. I yeah I yeah I mean the the last aid package was definitely more recent than J- July of twenty three the last big one may have been then um, I believe there has been actually one this year but it was it was rather small so um, Richard how are you it's good to see you hello uh, long time no speak um, just what Mary it said I believe it was Mary uh, made me want to come on uh, she was just talking about her son with autism. Um, very interesting fact for you. It was about a, a third of the volunteers that are in our tight knit group out here uh, are actually autistic, and we were trying to actually figure out if there was some um, kind of link between the people that were coming out and helping Ukraine and autism because it was like how, how like it's such a high percentage. Um, so yeah, just really really interesting. I don't know, maybe they're more more caring or empathetic, or there's some character traits but anyway I, I thought i'd randomly chime in with that but it, it genuinely is like a third if not half uh half of the people um most of the time when we're in a room so uh, yeah j- just a thing for for mary and anyone else out there that's wondering uh what what the volunteer demographic is uh, out here in ukraine it is interesting that is interesting because you know we we have um people that we talk to all the time on a regular basis and and even i believe i'm not quite sure i have to think a little bit more about it um some people who who may be a little bit on the autism spectrum somewhere um and uh that you know in around you know there's people around us all the time um especially you come up to speak um who are on the autism spectrum and it's always always a good thing and uh boy i really appreciate them um much most of the time let's put it that way and uh, having, I worked in, spe- I don't, I don't think you know this, Richard, I worked in special ed for 10 years um, earlier in my life. And I worked with a lot of autistic children. I worked with severely, severely handicapped children. And I still have a lot of friends who have kids with autism and severe disabilities. And, and I've mentioned this more than once. Um, I, I think about kids in Ukraine who are on ventilators all the time when the power goes out when there's a big, huge power problem. And I think about them because I have friends with kids on ventilators. And I know that uh, backup powers for ventilators only last so long. But that's also, I'm gonna take just a minute here and and remind people that we are currently doing a fundraiser. It is not for power at this point. What it is though, is for tactical gear for the uh, SBU Alpha units. Uh, Things like jackets, things like uh, boots, Things like uh, push to talk devices for their communication, um, a whole a whole array of things that they really need. I mean, it's like sometimes you find that there's just random odds and ends that you're missing in order to be able to do your um, your task correctly or do your task to the best efficiency or the best of your ability. And this, I think, is like one of those. These are these are odds and ends that really make their job something that they can do a whole lot more effectively so if you have the opportunity and are able to please donate um and because you know what i say is the sooner that and i i feel like i push this to maybe too much but the sooner we can finish with this fundraiser we can go to our next fundraiser and you know the sooner we can finish with this one the sooner we can get the stuff to the guys and the sooner we can start our next fundraiser and get stuff to those people um, and, uh, I actually am working on the next fundraiser and no, I'm not going to tell you what it is, but I am so excited for it. And I really hope that, uh, we, uh, we get to the, get to the finish line on our current fundraiser soon so that we can move on. And, uh, we we're getting there, we're getting there, but, uh, it still needs some work. Richard, did you have a follow-up? Uh, no, no, just, uh, on your, you're talking about, uh, fundraisers and whatnot. Um, I know we spoke previously, well, uh, me and some of the Maria people spoke previously about FPV fundraisers and that when you, you're next doing one of those, uh, get in touch with me and I'll I'll sort you out because I, I know that we don't make drones, 
Um, but we definitely did not destroy $5 million worth of Russian equipment in the past two days, which is very, very cool. But we definitely didn't do that. So, um, yeah, very, very exciting stuff. And if you're ever doing a fundraiser also just for injured soldiers, um, we're doing a Carpathians retreat this week where we're taking a load of guys up into the mountains um, that had fought on the very front. And it's a kind of psychological retreat for them. So. Uh, if you ever do that kind of humanitarian kind of side, uh, obviously it's very important tactical stuff and military stuff for our guys. But yeah, if you ever do campaigns that look after the soldiers after their back, let me know and I can help you out on the ground. Um, but yes, thank you very much for everything you're doing. And I will step down as speaker now. Thanks, Richard. It's good to see you. Uh, keep in touch, man. Um, Yenny, I think you were next and then we will go to Pinocchio. Uh, so I had to look it up. Uh, Michael, Sweden sent a package worth uh, 700 and something million dollars, which is roughly 1% of our, it's actually a little bit more than our GDP, 1% of our GDP. And we sent that on the 20th of February. And then we also sent money to the Czech initiative to get shells. 155 millimeter shells. And I know that just days after Sweden announced its record breaking large, that was the biggest military package that we sent to Ukraine since the invasion. And it was also number 15. So Sweden has sent 15 different packages. And uh, then Denmark did one shortly after. And I know Finland did one that was after the 20th of February, as well as Norway. And Iceland, who has a population of less than 400,000 people, they have also donated money to the initiative to get the 65 millimeter shells. So all of the Nordics have done packages just over, um, well, just over two months ago. Uh, or about two months ago. And the other countries, I have no idea. Just a, just a second, Pinocchio. Hang on. Yep, that's good information, Yanni. Thank you. Go ahead, Pinocchio. Uh, hello from the Czech Republic. I'm, I'm really proud to, to, uh, to say this because the Czech. Pinocchio, can you lean closer to your microphone? Oh, I can. Is this better? Much Way better. Down. Night and day. Excellent. Uh, hello from Czech Republic. I'm, I'm really glad I, I, I hear that. Uh, I hear appreciation for Czech initiative because this is remarkable. I, I mean, we need to take care of uh, disabled person, we need to take care of uh, autistic person and, and, and you name it. But we also need to take care of the conflict. And the conflict, uh, the, the, I mean, the, the, the base of our support is supposed to be in, in the money. Uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's cruel, it's, uh, it's simple, it's, it's brutal simple. Uh, but the money to support Ukraine and also to support politicians that support Ukraine. And now this is the question, uh, for me at least. Uh, do I support the politician who, who has some, for me, unbearable uh, point of view on some other topics, but he is... 100% for Ukraine. Do I do this step aside? Yes, I do. Because I know quite well that the Russians, not all of them, of course, are danger. They are animals. In 1945, when they came here, uh, well, when Nazis came here, uh, the people were scared. 
When in ni uh, 1939, 40, 41, 42, 43, 1945, when the Russians came in, in small villages, people were digging holes and, and burying themselves, or at least uh, daughters, because animals were coming. The, 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 this is, the, I, I don't know, I, I believe most of you, I, I hear the accent, uh, you know, I just, um, you are Americans, uh, most of you, but you can not imagine how big animals those Russians are. This, this, this is a big danger, and not only like man to man, uh, it's like government to government. It's good to think about it. It's good to think about it because th this is uh, this is priority. Once Ukraine would be down and it won't, because we all help. We all are a fact. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Pinocchio. I always appreciate when you pop up. Um, I, you know, I, I hadn't seen you ever before and I saw you for the first time the other day and I really appreciated what you had to say. And, you know, what I, what I'm going to say is that, you know, that's one of the things that I've really appreciated about this space and about, um, spending time in this space. You know, we, we don't, we do have a, a lot of Americans right now. Um, Yenny is not American. I know that, um, even though she has lived in the United States, um, Michael is not American. I apologize, Gerhard. I cannot remember if you are. Um, but um, we spend time, I, you know, I have spent time on this space, very concentrated time. We have, um, we have a co-host from Slovakia. Um, and uh, I've, we talk, and we have co-hosts from Romania. And, uh, and I very frequently talk to them about the difference of life from when when the USSR was part was was you know invaded in their country and um, when they were in control when Russia was in control um, and and I actually visited Czechoslovakia which is like everybody's like oh god here goes Heather with the Bratislava stories again I visited Czechoslovakia in 1989 and I I can I remember it was a very short period of time I was just there for a few days but it had an impact on me in a big way. And so being able to hear about the experiences of people who lived in that, lived in those situations is really important, I think. And I appreciate you coming up and sharing with us. You know what it's like, you know how hard we need to fight. You know why it's important that we continue to fight for, the, for Ukraine to have their free democracy and the way they want it because if we don't get it stopped at Ukraine, they'll keep coming, and you don't ever want to go back there. I know that. Michael, go ahead. Oh my God. I just want to say everybody's saying uh, how much help is giving to Ukraine. Ukraine needs only 50 billions to budget. Plus, plus minus 150 billions for military aid, and they don't get get it. They don't have ammo. They don't have air defense. They don't have nothing. Nothing. Just naked hands. Thank you. Oh, we get it. We understand, we see it, we know it, we talk about it on a regular, regular basis, and it's it's frustrating for us, and, and we spend time calling our lawmakers, and we are, you know, <laughs> we are we are trying, we, we understand. It's something that we talk about here on a regular basis, um, don't we, James? Oh, yeah, all the time. Um, I don't really think that they're down to just bare hands. I know they're equipped with knives, and that's a bit of a joke, but that is one tool there. Uh, but they're not quite down to nothing, but some units are almost bare. Uh, and so I believe you're right. 
in certain circumstances. And we have certainly seen situations where um, smaller groups of Ukrainians actually have to surrender because they're absolutely out of ammunition. Uh, it's not across the board, though, but you know, that is a very troubling thing anytime that happens. It's, a, it's horrible that, uh, you know, the aid gets choked off like this. It's, it's, um, and it's a lesson for us for the future about what we have to do. Uh, we can no longer ignore this risk from Russia. They, we just have to step up, spend the money that we need, because uh, unless we can defend ourselves from Russia and defend Ukraine from Russia, then we are not going to be able to enjoy the lives that we would like. Uh, what what good does it uh, you know do anybody to have all this uh, prosperity but no freedom? Uh, and because we know what will happen with Russia, um, they they take it off the top. And it's not that 2% that they take off the top. They take a lot off the top. They are highly corrupt. So we, we wouldn't enjoy freedom. We wouldn't enjoy our prosperity. And uh, we'd realize what a bargain a good defense system is and what a powerful tool deterrence can be. We're not there with Ukraine right now. We, we're... Uh, we're in the act of shooting war way past, um, you know, what deterrence could have done. And uh, that is an error on everybody's part. Again, um, we, because I think we could have done a lot more uh, deterrence before the large scale invasion. And uh, even even before uh, 2014, because we signed the Budapest memo in um, 1994, and that's when deterrence efforts really should have stepped up right then because it was silly to assume that Russia was going to play well uh, with others because that has never been the case. But boy, did they fool us. Um, this this pretend democracy stuff uh, really took us in. And um, in 2012, they abandoned democracy and went back to their ways by um, pretending democracy and then pursuing empire again. So here we are again, and uh, it's a bad place for Ukraine to be. It's a, it's a real disaster. Um, and what we can do is um, start by getting this damn bill through Congress. Um, that's that's what we need to do in the United States. Uh, it's, it's a difficult process. There are many, many uh, people who are unduly influenced in our government at this point by Russia. So we're sort of in trouble that way, Prince, uh, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. And boy, howdy, I look away for a second. How many hands do we have up? James, do you know who was next? Well, to tell you the truth, I think it was Gerhardt and then Jenny and then Pinocchio and then Michael, but I'm not sure. Oh, it sounds good to me. Gerhard, go. Yeah, hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Thank you. It's good to see you. Yeah, just just uh, got a new headset, so <laughs> I'm a bit uns unsure. Uh, what? Uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not so here so often. Um, I'm from Germany, by the way. You know, <laughs> didn't remember, I think. <laughs> um, just on a side note, um, I just tuned in when when you were talking about calling your representatives in the U.S. And I just wanted to uh, if. Uh, that's the way you, you, you try to influence them. Um, I, I guess you, you don't speak to them personally, just, but just to their offices then, right? Hello? Could you repeat the question? I'm sorry, I'm just struggling to make uh, sure I, I understand I hear, it. I hear, I, hear, um, I hear these calls to, to call your representatives. And I wonder if, if that's the way to, to, to make an impact on, on the U.S. Uh, members of parliament, which is, 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 is it's a bit strange for me as German. So we don't do this. Maybe you should try it. Uh, it's, it's the way, really. Um, you know, emails, uh, letters. 
phone calls are probably the best thing. Uh, the, 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 you know, protesting is another good thing that happens. Um, and, uh, you know, unless you're going to stage some kind of, you know, um, crisis in the United States, and we don't want that. We don't want to have a fake, uh, you know, attack that justifies doing something. That's That would be Russia's way of doing things. We don't want to do that. So short of that, I think absolutely the best approach is for everyone to get on the phones and call congressmen. You don't have to restrict it just to your district. The, that's the most powerful phone call you can make. But they count uh, every every uh, call that comes in, regardless of where it's from. And uh, so we can we can see uh, a daily total. I'm sorry, they can see a daily total of how many calls they got. And they have some, um, they do already have some recognition of the pressure that is on them. In particular, I think Mike Johnson, you can tell he recognizes it. He said, yes, we'll take this up as a vote. Now, has he? No, he has not. Uh, And I think that'll be his position for a while. But uh, we don't have a lot of other tools uh, short of overthrowing our government violently. And we're not going to do that. Uh, we're just not going to do that. That would be worse than um, worse than the alternative, as far as I'm concerned. It would take away uh, one of uh, Ukraine's greatest allies, uh, the United States. So we don't want that to happen either. Um, so, But that's about all we can do with Gerhardt. And um, I thought you guys did have sort of a, a, a track record of doing that, but maybe I'm thinking of another country. Um, it's, it's more, you know, just, just a follow up question. You, you talk to the offices of your reps then, not to the reps themselves. Uh, they might be too busy. Oh yeah. That's usually the case. They have a staff. Um, <clears throat> if you get to talk to a representative or Senator, it's probably because you landed a check on their desk first. Uh, you know, for the campaign next campaign finance, it's not a bribe, but frankly, this is this is what happens. Um, it, and it's not illegal to uh, you know to donate for somebody's campaign fund, uh, and it, but it is one of the best ways to get their ear. It doesn't mean that you'll get their vote uh, the way you'd like it, but it may get their ear. Um, and you know, so that's the other way, but. Um, uh, we're not going to do that. Uh, most of us aren't going to be able to do that, Gerhardt. Uh, I uh, you know, so. Me too. Me too. I, uh, I want Gerhardt. Can I give you? Can I just give you an example, really quick? I, I'm just. I just want to. I used to work downtown. I used to work downtown, right next door to City Hall. And I will tell you what happened to me on a regular basis. On a very regular basis. When I was outside on the street, you know, walking walking on the sidewalk, I would see my congressmen and I would see my senators. They would be downtown Portland going to a meeting or something like that. And maybe because I'm stupid or something, I'm not shy about going up and talk to, talking to them. And so for me to just approach my senator or my congressman when I saw them on the street, was not an uncommon thing to do. I would go up, shake their hand, talk to them a little bit, let them go on their way. But really, um, you know, we don't always have, uh, you know, that was a unique situation. I haven't seen my congressmen or senators in person since I stopped working downtown. But, you know, just to say, you know, when they are, everybody calls it, they go on vacation. What they're actually doing is do it, doing work in their districts, which means that they are here usually. I mean, they're, they're working in the area that they represent. And so that is, that is something that, you know, gives us the opportunity at times to try to have meetings with them or at least their staff. So it's, it's not that uncommon here in the U.S. and it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing. And, you know, I, I send emails and things like that to my congressmen and to my senators, and I get responses back. Some of the responses suck, but sometimes they're not so bad. Right, James? Uh, sometimes, that's right. Uh, there's a lot of good people in Congress. Uh, many people are there for the right reasons to serve the country and 
and that what goes along with that usually is um, a good personality and a willingness to talk with people that they're supposed to represent. It's not universal, however, Prince. This is true. Yeah, if I can interject, if, if I can interject, I have been on the phone to David Schweiker's office here in Phoenix, Arizona, on a daily basis to the point where the interns recognize my voice and you hear them shrivel over the phone. The invective oh, that I game. use is not exactly nice, but it's not intolerable as regards our position. And I keep up constant pressure. It, it, it's now it's now to the point where I'm going to have to take time out of my day to go to his strict office and bang on the glass like a sparrow. I don't know. That's all I got. Well, thank you. Uh, we, we let you go out of turn, though, so we're going to have to turn it over to Jenny, who I think is next. Uh, appreciate your comment there. Uh, I'm getting an image of you as a sparrow outside the window. Uh, tap, tap, tap. I wasn't. Jenny. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. I wasn't rattling off the numbers to make myself look good. You asked for it. You asked, when was the last time your country donated something for Ukraine? I am the first one to tell you that I am forever critical of my government. We can do more. I know we can. We haven't done enough. And I've also noticed that there is a higher level of donations. There's a bigger readiness to to work out packages to send to Ukraine, whether they be military or monetary, based on proximity to Russia. The closer you get to Russia, the bigger the packages, if you compare it to GDP, because the biggest donor is Estonia. They have a really small economy, but they're giving everything that they have because they know. They they're acutely aware of what it was like to live under the Soviet Union. They're also extremely aware of where they fall in the order of invasion. I think it's uh, Moldova, 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 Georgia, and then the Baltics. They're fully aware. And they know what what is at stake at this war. I don't yell and scream and curse at people here because frankly, it's against the rules. So I go and do that in, in on a different app. And I go and yell at people to get their ass in gear and contact their local representatives that can yell at a higher level until they get to the government of parliament or whatever structure you have in your government, in your country. And I don't have limitations on the other one. So when I, I get really frustrated about having to play nice here and I go there and I do a scream fest. And I then I actually talk mostly to, I wouldn't say that they're MAGA, but they are MAGA adjacent people. And I yell and scream at them. And I tell them how big of a unwed, children of unwed mothers that they are. And I don't mince words. And I explain to them what is going on because of the squabble in, in their political machinery in the US. And if there's somebody else who, like Spain, who has a lot of patriot systems and is in no danger of being invaded by Russia anytime soon, they can give up their, they can safely give up their their patriot systems, they can lend them to Ukraine. And I get really creative with my solutions when I put my mind to it. For example, instead of stealing the money that we confiscated and froze the assets of, all, like of, of Russia, instead of stealing that money, I decided that we should do a non-consensual donation of that money to Ukraine in Russia's name because they are breaking Ukraine right now and they should be made to pay for that. 
That is my opinion. So thank you. It's a pretty popular opinion in my opinion. Um, yeah, we, we all want that uh, money to go to Ukraine one way or the other. Um, I know that there's been discussion here in the States that we ought to get the money in exchange for the weapons that Ukraine needs, for example. Um, well, I don't know about that. I don't know what the right answer is there. But what is right is that that money um, not be definitely not be given back to Russia. No way in hell it should go back there. Um, although I can think of examples where it might uh, play a meaningful role in accomplishing some of Ukraine's goals. But I don't I yeah, I think they should pay on top of uh, whatever the $307 billion, I think it is, something like that, uh, above and beyond, they have to pay back much more than that. Uh, I'm sure damages are approaching a trillion dollars in Ukraine. And uh, so that that total amount um, isn't but a third, you know, of what they probably should pay. And they should probably pay even more. So It'd be a great start, though, Jenny, wouldn't it? It would be a great start, and I would be 100% behind it. I don't know. This is probably, there's probably similar pressures around the money, political considerations, blah, blah, blah. But I don't know. I don't understand this part as well. So thank you, Jenny. Yeah. I, I appreciate it. Go ahead. But the trick is it's a non-consensual. So we don't need to ask for their permission. It, instead of stealing it, it's just a non-consensual donation. You know, it's so it's not going to be paid back and they don't need to sign at the dotted line because we decided for them that this is going towards Ukraine and Ukraine gets to do whatever they want with it if they want to buy weapons or if they want to save the money until after the war is over and rebuild all their cities. It is up to them. Because again, it's non-consensual. That's the beauty of it. I don't care what the Russians think of it. So, but I'm gonna also gonna say good night because uh, it's midnight and I have to get up at like five thirty tomorrow morning. You know, hey. Yenny, I did. I did actually. Not too long ago, I looked at the time and I said I looked at my big huge time sheet of what time is it here, what time is it there, what time is it everywhere. Oh, good lord. Um, and I said, you know, Yenny is getting is it's getting late, and uh, Yenny told us to make her go to bed. Uh, Yenny's a listener right now. I can I can kick her out of the space. Nah, I mean J Yenny's a speaker right now. I can kick her out of the space, but it's like, nah, you're a grown woman. You can figure it out. If you're grumpy because you didn't get enough sleep, I'll hear about it in the morning when I'm still up. <laughs> go get some sleep, woman. But thank you for joining us and thank you for speaking up. We sure appreciate uh, your comments about this and the information about Sweden um, and their aid. Uh, the, yeah, that was the request, wasn't it? So thank you very much. Have, have a good evening. Well, friends, uh, that leaves two hands here. Uh, and if you know who's next, uh, call it because I'm not quite sure. I'm next. May I? Go ahead, Pinocchio. Yeah. Thank you. I would like to thank you. I'll be really short. Uh, I think it's, it's a it's a remarkable. It's important, and 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 it, it it's it's just fucking wonderful that you care and you do this space. And I would like to thank you for this because it really makes difference. And, and and that's it. Um, period. Thank you for that. Good night. Thank you, Pinocchio. Sure, appreciate it. You know, I work for the kibble from from the CIA. The CIA kibble is the world's best kibble. If it were on the market, it would be the top seller, I'm sure, uh, because that's what brain damaged dogs like. And uh, well, anyways, yeah. So, so we say. Anyway, thank you very much, Pinocchio. I'm glad you joined us, and uh, come back anytime. It was great to have you up uh, to speak. Thanks, and for the humor as well. <laughs> so, appreciate it, Prince. Now we're down to one. Uh, Michael, go ahead. I'll have to figure out something to say again. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, I've said something. 
to print and something to uh, in messages. Uh, can you add it uh, to uh, to the nest, please? It's about uh, conspiracy theory and and stuff like that. Thank you. Could could you put it down into the chat, the purple pill, the uh, area down at the bottom? We we'd really um, like to vet things before you put them up in the nest, and you're you're owning up to it being kind of the conspiracy stuff. So I think it belongs in the chat rather than the nest. But I I honestly. Um, uh, as it goes with conspiracies, I appreciate the art of conspiracy. I appreciate the fiction of conspiracy. And sometimes I realize some of them are true. So I'm willing to look. I'm willing to think about it and uh, turn it over in my head and see if it makes sense. Um, but uh, yeah, please go ahead. And you have it in the chat. The chat. Welcome. You have it in chat. Okay, very good. Appreciate that. Thank you, Michael. Hope Welcome. you understand our reasoning about that. Uh, Prince, uh, we now have uh, no speakers, but us. Uh, we're, we're not speakers, we're co-hosts, but I'm speaking, so that makes me a speaker. Does that mean I have a multiple personality? Never mind, don't answer that. Uh, one of the things I would like to do is, uh, <clears throat> is go and read out the numbers from the day. Now, I realize that if you've been listening for the last 18 hours, you've probably heard them, but I'm assuming that many of you have not been up here for 18 hours, probably, um, well, probably less than 12, and so maybe you've only heard it once. Nonetheless, uh, the nature of 24-hour news cycle being what it is, you're going to hear the same stories more than once uh, in a day. So I'm going to go ahead with that, unless... Prince, you've got some burning issue that you would like to explore. Um, I'm looking for the next controversial piece to inspire people to come up and raise hands. So yes, I am looking. You're you're a genius at this. So I'm going to let you be genius, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, read out the numbers from today. And so this is when we say numbers, we mean. Um, Oh, well, on the way to the numbers, guess what I found? Two years ago, um, Ukrainian warriors destroyed the largest warship of the Russian Black Sea Fleet, the cruiser of Moskva. And so the uh, Ukrainian military struck the Russian cruiser uh, with Neptune-class missiles in the area of Snake Island and inflicted serious damage on it, I would say so. The cruiser sank while being towed to its port of destination. So, uh, and uh, the uh, most important question says the defense of you account, defense of Ukraine account, is um, how Moscow is doing at the bottom of the Black Sea. And I imagine that they have lots of company, that the fish like the architecture. Because anything that has an open port or maybe a hole blasted in the bottom lets the fish swim in and out, and they're protected from bigger fish. So I'm thinking that the Moskva has settled in and made a new home for itself. What do you think, Prince? Oh, I think that there is a nice, nice collection of things at the bottom of the Black Sea that uh, one day there will be scuba diving adventures in the Black Sea that will be complete tours of destroyed Russian equipment. There are planes, there are boats, there are, well, things that will biodegrade. But anyway, um, <laughs> sorry. So like I'm, I'm the Black Sea Fleet Tour Operator, so I'll pick up the phone and say, uh, Black Sea Fleet Tours, how can I help you? And uh, there'll be people there saying, we want a tour. Uh, except it'll be on the internet. Anyway, so I, I won't get a job that way, darn it. Anyway, uh, but it, back it, to it the will numbers. it will be it will be Black Sea underwater tours. So not just Black Sea tours, because Black Sea tours could be above, you know, could be floating around on the water, which of course this would entail in order to get to the location to go scuba diving. It would be over the waves and under the waves. And um, that's the way I'm sure everybody would like it. I think that would be cool. 
and a little bit more than a, a, a glass bottom boat probably would be necessary. So, uh, yeah, they, it might be a submarine tour. I think there is such a thing somewhere. Where did I hear that? Anyways, I'm talking about the number, so I'm going to get to that. And uh, the English version version that I'm on the Defense of Ukraine account uh, always has a quote to go with the numbers. And today's quote is from Oprah Winfrey, a star of television in the United States, known for her talk shows, in case you didn't know. And uh, the quote is, where there is no struggle, there is no strength. And that's an interesting quote. I think I can go along with that. But in any case, that is uh, neither here nor there. Uh, but I think they actually do a good job of picking quotes of the day. So <clears throat> the combat uh, losses of Russian forces from February 24th of 22 to April 14th of uh, 24 are as follows. In total, the eliminated personnel are 453,650, of which 800 and, is that right, 890 uh, were from today. So a very good day there. Uh, tanks, five. Oh, it's low. It's low, Prince, but it's not inordinately okay, low. Okay, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, you got to say, not inordinately low. We have been spoiled lately with increased take losses. It's the reality. Because I remembered many times in the last year when Mockers reads the numbers in the morning and she says, look, Heather, there's one. There's one tank. And I said, oh, look. That's the same as they had in the parade in Moscow. Or, you know, or, uh, you know, we there are two tanks. Oh, that's one more tank than they had in the parade of Moscow. So, you know what? Four more tanks than they had in the parade of Moscow on May 9th is an improvement. And I think we need to start um, taking guesses for how many parades will be, eh, how many parades, how many tanks will be in the parade this year. Because May 9th is coming up. It's less than a month away. Are they even going to have the parade? Anyway, sorry to interrupt. But, yes, it no is not. Problem. We have gotten spoiled with higher numbers lately, and you know they they come in they they go in waves, and oftentimes I find that Sunday numbers are a little bit lower. Same with Monday, so it may be a absolutely. weekend thing. We'll see. I I absolutely agree about the weekend effect of this, and uh, it uh, it's it's all good. And I really was. Um, stretching a point here when I said that's low, inordinately low. It really isn't. It's within, I would say, the, um, the oh, I don't know, probably one standard deviation either way from the mean of the tank losses for the day. So it really isn't inordinately low. I was exaggerating, and I got a response. Anyways, armored combat vehicles, 20 were lost by Russia. Uh, artillery. 34, very good. Multiple launch rocket systems. We're up to 1,046 overall with one added today. That's a good number. Uh, air defense systems, two, which makes a total of 758 uh, since the beginning of the large-scale invasion. That's a lot. Drones, 34 were shot down today. These are the big tactical drones like the Shahids. That we're talking about. Uh, so that is good because everyone that is shot down isn't landing somewhere where it shouldn't. Uh, one cruise missile. And uh, by the way, we're up over um, 2,000 with uh, 2,089 in total. So that, again, uh, that's a lot of cruise missiles that they've shot down, and that's good on air defense. Uh, let's see, fuel uh, vehicles and fuel tanks. Uh, we had 63 of those destroyed. Now, that means they're not armored. Uh, they're vehicles, and they're in a shooting zone. It's not a good place to go without armor, and uh, it shows here today. Uh, so that is a good thing. And then special equipment, it, actually, this is a really good number, 12 pieces of special equipment. And what I, I read from this is that they were trying to do something special, and they were unable to do it because the equipment got destroyed. And that's the point is uh, it, it, we really, um, we, as in the Ukrainian armed forces, 
uh, really do prevent a lot of uh, worse things from happening by destroying all this equipment. So very good day for Ukraine, uh, followed up by a huge week where uh, we saw the largest amount, a uh, seven-day total, that is, in the whole uh, large-scale invasion. So, uh, yeah, these these are good things. It's offset uh, by the uh, strong air attacks that uh, Russia is making. Uh, but still, these are uh, great numbers, and we should take the wins where we see them. And uh, so this was definitely a, a win by Ukraine. So those the numbers, and um, I guess um, I guess I've given you enough time, perhaps, to find something of interest. Uh, and I have other things that I can talk about that I bookmarked. I forget exactly what I bookmarked at this point, though, Prince. I'm looking. I, I'm actually looking through. Sometimes on the weekend, I like to look through um, some of my some of my older things that I haven't had the opportunity to talk about. And um, so, yeah, so we're going back all the way to February 11th for this story. How's that for you? But this is a story that I, um, that, that I thought was rather interesting when I read it at the time. Mistaken for spies. People are being mistaken for spies in Ukraine, James. These are Ukraine's bird watchers, yet they find comfort in the destruction. So basically, these people are going out and looking and um, trying to research and count the birds and where they are, and ha because that's an important kind of thing. Um, but there are a lot of places where you cannot go bird watch because you have to go with a camera or binoculars and there are military sites. So sometimes you don't even know where you can go. So even in the West of Ukraine, where this guy is talking from, bird watching is sometimes a dangerous thing. You can be there watching birds doing something very legitimate, but you're there with, but not, you know, with, with cameras and you're there with, with things to, uh, oh, what am I, binoculars, Those that's the one that I'm thinking of. And people think you're spying on them when all you're doing is trying to look at the birds. So bird watching is actually not extremely common in Ukraine. Um, it is, you know, in like the UK and the United States, there are big, huge bird watching organizations. But Ukrainian bird, num bird watchers, they, they are only a, maybe a few hundred. Um, so not in the thousands. Um, so uh, it, I think it, I just think it was very, very interesting. But for them, it's very interesting also because I think that connecting with the nature also is a reprieve from the psychological stress of war. A day of watching birds might be looking through a window at a backyard bird feeder or traveling to other oblasts in search of a new species and that add to the life list lists of birds they've identified. Um, some enthusiastic bird watchers have recorded seeing more than 300 species of birds in, the Ukra in Ukraine. Um, so there's that, I just thought it was a very, very interesting thing, but also we, the habitat ability, the habitat, um, uh, the formation of the habitat for some of these birds has really changed because of the shape, of, because of the war. If you look at, you know, areas of forests and trees and, you know, tr birds make their nest in trees, um, you know, a lot of those things have disappeared because of the damage that has happened during the war. And so tracking maybe where these birds may be staying more. I know there was a flock of flamingos that, um, that have basically come in from other countries and established now like a new flock in Ukraine where their the old flock basically is gone and they've had their babies now and so there's new Ukrainian flamingos which is which is absolutely fabulous I love it um, there's also within the last couple of weeks there was an image of a uh, was it a pelican nest 
I believe, at the top of a like a telephone pole, and this tell this flat this uh, uh excuse me this this nest caught on fire and was destroyed. And the bird kept coming back to the top of that pole and just, you know, crying out because its nest was gone. And so the um, people in the area, they got together and they made like a metal kind of nest and put a bunch of stuff in it so that the pelican could feel like there was maybe the nest still there or at least a base to start with. And um, the, the pelican then, all, of course, made its nest again. And uh, so that that was a good thing to to observe. Um, so the way that we have seen um, Ukraine care for the animals, especially the birds. I mean, even in um, the documentary uh, that the Scruff showed us, they found an injured bird. They took that injured bird to the vet, and they cared for that bird and helped that bird to recover. Uh, and before they released it back. And so, you know, we see even the military taking care of the birds. And uh, we have the bird watchers out there keeping a watch. And even with the, all the environmental damage, keeping a watch on what these birds are doing. And I think it's absolutely fabulous that they're doing this. But it is very interesting, I think, that they are, there is a concern and they have to be careful because people mistake them for spies on a regular basis. What do you think of that? Well, uh, yeah, I um, I don't think I'd have the courage to go bird watching in occupied um, Ukraine, honestly, because um, I would, you know, frankly, um, I don't feel comfortable setting up my little uh, mini telescope to look at the birds on top of the church. Uh, within sight of my house. Uh, they love that in the wintertime. Uh, a bunch of, um, well, a bunch of birds that usually aren't there in the summer. They come in the wintertime and they gather around the chimney. About um, about 30 of these large birds can fit on the top of this chimney. It's a pretty big chimney. Uh, and uh, so that, I'll look at that because that's the backyard, but I'd hate the idea that somebody would think I was like using my binoculars to observe through somebody's window or something like that. That would be, that kind of creeps me out myself. Um, but I think that, uh, yeah, they, there's a reason to be uh, very careful about that. So hopefully uh, they, they take care to uh, cover up, maybe use a blind to do that, although maybe that makes you look more suspicious. I don't know, Prince, but I think that uh, I, I'm glad that they're taking care of nature. This is one of these things where um, you, you either take care of stuff like this or sometimes uh, you lose a species, you know what I mean? And uh, that's that's always a shame to hear that another species has gone extinct. And it's I know it's the last kind of thing that Ukraine wants to hear about. All just it's you know that doesn't qualify as qualify as genocide, but I know there's also ecocide going on in Ukraine, and so that uh, that all uh, you know that's all the damage to the environment that that is happening. Um, I believe Robin is going to take over for me, um, and she's going to just start her session just a little bit early. Which Robin, give me a thumbs up if you're ready, and I really appreciate it. So I can go and, you know, feed the birds and get something to eat before I co-host again in a little while. So if uh, that's okay with you, James, I am going to skedaddle out of here so that Robin can uh, replace me and uh, finish out the rest of your time here. I uh, really appreciate it. And, uh, and I will, uh, I'm sure I will talk to you soon. Thank you, James. I'll be back. Later. Well, I appreciate I, I know you will. Um, and thank you for coming up to, to spend time with me. Um, I know this is not your regular time, so it is much appreciated that you are doing coverage here. Uh, it's something that uh, that we do for each other. Uh, things change. Uh, life interferes, darn it, um, with our plans as well. So we do this for each other, don't we, Prince? And uh, it's a good thing that we do. So I'm glad you're here with me, and it's been actually quite fun, and you did an amazing job 
bringing the hands. I'll have to uh, pay more attention to how you did that next time. It was like uh, you pulled find, a rabbit out of the hat. Find a controversial subject, James. That's what they cling to. Especially if Will is up. Will hears the word controversy and he will come up and create it. So with that, I'm going to get out of here. I'll talk to you later. All right. Well, I'll, I'll work on that skill. Let's see. Um, peanut butter and jelly versus pickled herring. Maybe not controversial enough there, but uh, I'll keep working on that to see what I can come up with. But in the meantime, uh, I'm happy to know that we do have a replacement for Prince coming up. That is. But in the meantime, I'll begin uh, by saying that uh, we're Maria Report. We're here 24-7, in case you didn't know, with slight breaks provided by our sponsor, uh, but we are still, I calculated this, uh, we're still well above 99% uptime, which is pretty good. And if you look at the ratio of commercials to uh, televised programs, you'll know that we're doing better than any network in terms of that. But uh, we have our own commercials built in, so to speak, and that would be the fundraiser. Right, Robin? And welcome. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. Yes, absolutely. I was thinking it sounded like you were aiming toward the fundraiser. So I'm going to let I'm going to hand it back to you. But guys, open your wallets. Let's get going. Ukraine needs our help. And we have a great chance to, to help them right now. So I'll let James tell you about it. Will do. Um, this is for tactical gear for uh, two SBU alpha units. And these are premier units that um, really have a large scope that could be anywhere in Ukraine or possibly out of it. Uh, and um, that this is um, this is the kind of unit that I'm glad that we hooked up with, um, that we have connections through very few people, I might add, uh, more or less a, a very short chain of trust uh, by which we transfer um, the goods at, to who needs it. And uh, that that put me at ease about this whole situation of donating money, uh, not being sure where it goes. But what I do know where this is going to go is to provide the equipment that these units ask for and that they need. We are not providing drones. We've done that before. We've done a lot of other kinds of equipment before. And, of course, all these items are non-lethal, comporting with the 501c3 uh, requirements uh, that we not do that. Although, um, as I said to Tracy, uh, Tracy, it may not be lethal, but on your avatar, uh, it's a killer look. But anyways, that's humor, um, perhaps weak humor. But anyways, combat ear protection. This is um, good ear protection. This is integrated with electronic communication so that they can have their ears protected. Well, things are going boom around them, but they can talk amongst themselves, which gives them a real advantage in terms of uh, coordinating their efforts well in the field. So very important thing. Tactical plate carriers. This is not waiters carrying plates. This is uh, the, um, <clears throat> oh boy, the netting. Uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, anyways, it is uh, it is worn around the the body oh boy i'm sorry i'm still like, like real big pockets that you've that you put the, uh, real you big. Put the protection into the, the plates yeah yeah exactly the it, yeah it's not elegant scary. but you get the idea that's so well it's it's ceramic and steel uh, plates that go in there that stop the heavy uh calorie bullets um calorie oh my gosh caliber bullets like the the 5.62 uh, NATO rounds and things like that that really go fast, hit hard, and go through you otherwise. And the harness, that was the word I was looking for, that uh, it, it is made of Kevlar or some such material, extreme strength, it can stop fragments. And that's good enough. And it also, as uh, has been pointed out repeatedly, uh, this is enough to hold your guts on the inside where they belong. Because if um, you've got a problem with your guts being on the outside, it's not a good thing. So those are important in themselves. And um, we're not buying the tactical plates. I'm not sure where they're coming from. But the carriers are expensive being made of Kevlar and being impregnated. Uh, and probably 
I think all of the clothing is impregnated with um, materials that make them less flammable, which is important um, so that you don't burn up as easily. Uh, that's a good thing not to burn. Uh, the uh, jackets, lots of pockets. I bet some electronic um, gear has special routes that it can travel through uh, the jacket lining. Also, a uh, very tough material, low visibility, so that they're not easily seen uh, or less easily seen with thermal gear. Um, very good stuff. Boots, uh, everybody's friend is a good pair of shoes. If you don't have comfortable shoes on, it's going to ruin your day probably. And uh, boy, have I tried to wear some shoes without socks and found out, oh no, this doesn't work. And I found out the hard way. So this is this is great stuff. And um, we're giving it to these two SBU Alpha units and they're fighting on the front lines currently. So we have a link in the nest, in the thread, uh, and you can go there or you can go to mariareport.org and you'll find the donate button on the front page there. Either way, uh, and the money goes to um, purchase these and then the goods are delivered. Uh, and it's so it's a good thing that we're doing and it is tax deductible if you're in the United States or Canada because apparently, little do I know these things, but have been told by authorities in it that um, we have a way to donate to Can Canadian charities uh, or Ukrainians can donate to American charities and get the same, uh, not exactly the same, but the same type of tax, be tax benefits from that. <clears throat> so uh, can't guarantee what that uh, tax benefit will be for you. It just depends a lot on income and donation size and the like. So, uh, but it is a really good thing that we can do now, especially well equipment that they so badly need is not coming from the United States. This is a good way uh, to make up in part, and really it's a small part, uh, honestly, uh, but in part uh, for what Ukraine is not getting from the United States. And even though it's a small part, uh, our donations have added up over time and we've made a substantial uh, difference in the way that the war is fought by Ukraine. And it it's, uh, does my heart good to know that we're protecting people's health on the front line. And, uh, you know, well, that, that is the essence of war, is um, staying alive and achieving your objectives on the field and uh, getting, getting the enemy to uh, do whatever it is you will them to do. And that, those are the things that you can only do with the right equipment. Uh, without the right equipment, well, we don't have to imagine what that's like. We're seeing what that's like in Ukraine now as, um, as supplies do run low. So, uh, you know, think about how much you can give and give. We're not asking for everything. Uh, what I think uh, <clears throat> Ukraine wants are uh, allies that can continue to give uh, rather than, you know, blow it all, lose their house, whatever. That, that sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? Um, we don't want that. We don't want your rent money, maybe your lunch money once a week or something like that, maybe more than that. It depends on you and uh, your ability to spend and uh, how much you care about Ukraine. So um, that that's sort of a more extended version than I usually do, Robin. Well, it's a good one. And I, I think, you know, you touched on a couple of things. Um, I think also one of the things we've heard over and over again from from uh, guys in these in these units that we've been able to help is how important it is, uh, not only the physical things we're sending them, but knowing that they have been forgotten, um, I think there's there is a certainly an an element of of uh, of despair of dis, uh, well despair is too strong a word of of disappointment with a lot of Ukrainians right now that the United States is really letting them down big time, <clears throat> which we are, um, and I I remain horrified about that. But this uh, the help that we're able to give as an American charity. And, you know, they, it's we're clear that we're not only American, they know that it's the people all over the world are supporting the Maria Report. But it's, I think it's a very powerful psychological 
gift also that these guys know when they get these, you know, these boots or the tactical pants that we provided a while ago or the plate carries, whatever, that there are people just regular people in the United States and elsewhere who care enough about them to, uh, you know, to give of their personal, their personal money to perhaps make some, perhaps make some sacrifices to help. So that's an important thing too. Um, I also wanted to, to remind people we're still in the muddy season in Ukraine. Um, and these guys are the, you know, the Ukrainian uh, military, they do their best to provide, uh, to provide, um, uniforms and boots and plate holders, all the stuff, but they just don't have, they don't have enough. You know, they, they, it's, they, there's a real balancing act that has to be, uh, uh, that has to be maintained between the material that the troops need to function well and weaponry. And, you know, you can understand how we, we pick up the slack in the non-lethal support so that Ukraine can focus more on the lethal support, which is obviously critical to getting this war won. So, um, you know, and as I said, with boots, you know, in, in during the muddy season, you have to have at least two pairs of boots, probably three, because once the boot is saturated, it's going to take a couple of days to dry out. And, um, you know, as 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 uh, as uh, James was saying, it's not comfortable to 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 wear, you know, boots that are in a bad state. And there's a real risk of remember how how uh, how how dangerous trench foot was, especially in the First World War. And unfortunately, this trench warfare that a lot of uh, frontline Ukrainian troops involved in is very reminiscent of the First World War that way. And uh, they, it's critical that they have enough boots that they can have dry, uh, safe boots on their feet at all times. So, you know, it's we call it non-lethal uh, non -lethal aid, and it is, but at the same time, it is life-saving aid. So it's sort of the opposite of lethal. Anyway, not only are we, is it not lethal, but we really are doing our best to help these guys get home in one piece and also able to hear their grandchildren you know the the uh, the ear protection is vi is vitally important uh, there are going to be a lot of uh, of um uh people with with disabilities from having served in the military during this during this uh resistance to this full, this, this genocidal invasion and ukraine is going to have its hands full for many years uh helping these people to to uh you know be able to have fulfilling complete lives and anything we can do to help uh, fewer people be in that category, it's a it's a really big thing, and it will and it will it will uh, it will uh, reverberate down through years. It's not just what we're doing now. This is going to have consequences for years to come. So, good thing to feel to feel uh, good about all around. Thanks. Back to you, James. Uh, very good points. Uh, you know, I especially take that. Um, that last point to heart about the hearing in old age. And um, uh, a lot of my friends were in bands and uh, they lost their hearing to much less uh, exposure to noise than these soldiers will be exposed to. And uh, so what we can do to, uh, you know, stop, help stop um, that uh, hearing loss is, is good for Ukraine for, you know, decades in the future. And uh, for that matter, Keeping these people alive uh, to resume life once the war is won in Ukraine is a, another great gift back to Ukraine because, uh, you know, they're getting killed in large numbers in Ukraine. And uh, it's it's um, it really hurts them as a nation, as well as just obviously hurting the people who've lost loved ones <clears throat> to the war. And so uh, it, it makes Ukraine stronger whenever we can uh, protect these soldiers' lives. And uh, it makes a meaningful difference in the world in a way that uh, it, it's hard to come up with a better cause in my mind. It really is. I understand there are uh, many people in need around the world, uh, but I cannot think of a more important nation to help uh, because they are the closest to what's going wrong in the world. And they are one of the uh, countries most able to do the job that needs to be done, which is stop the Russian army and, uh, you know, push them back. And they really, uh, they have the right motivation. Uh, you know, when they have the right tools and the right motivation, that goes a long way toward victory because that gives them high morale, uh, you know, to have the right equipment. And then that that motivation that comes from knowing 
that they're defending their own democracy, that they're defending their people, their legally established land, uh, and their values, uh, and their choices for their own future, there's a lot there that uh, makes them a more powerful force. And um, I think we're, we're a part of that, and a small part, again, but we are a, a substantial part nonetheless. And so uh, when I say we, and I do that a lot when I talk about Ukraine, I mean it in the sense that I'm on their side. I'm not really Ukrainian. Um, I've been working a little bit, uh, Robin, on the Ukrainian language with Duo uh, Lingo. Uh, but let's not talk about that now because I'm not very far along. But uh, yeah, it, it, I'm proud to know of Ukraine. I've been so happy to have had a chance now to learn about it directly by talking to people from Ukraine and also by reading about its history and, uh, you know, keeping up with the news of the current day through Maria Report and all the uh, information that I learned um, myself, you know, checking the feeds and things like this, looking for news, but also from Maria Report staff who uh, sure share a whole lot of stories. And so, you're part of a community that's probably better informed than um, 99% of the people outside of Russia and outside of, uh, well, they probably don't know much at all, actually. Uh, but outside of Ukraine, we're one of the most informed groups in the world about what's happening to Ukraine and in Ukraine. So um, that uh, places sort of a special uh, responsibility on us. That's how I feel. Because once you know about these things, I think we do have responsibilities. And it's, uh, you know, it's a great cause, Robin. I'm going to stop there because yeah. I'm rambling a bit. <laughs> well, you, you, you do rambling, Will James, so we're not going to complain about it. But yes, I think, I think this is, is true. I mean, I, I actually think that, uh, you know, it's interesting. We don't, have a, we don't have a research department at Murray Report. We just have a lot of people who really uh, have have uh, gravitated to certain areas of the news and who really do in, you know, in-depth uh, dives into things. Tracy probably knows more about SBU than anybody outside of Ukraine. I and mean, it's really amazing. Heather is a, is a, um, you know, is a research monster. Um, mockers. I mean, I, I shouldn't start naming people because I, I wouldn't be naming enough people. Bee feeder, I see as a listener, keeps a lot of us supplied with, with all sorts of really in-depth analyses. Um, so this is a good place to be if you want to get a get a feel for what's going on. You know, something I, I um, as as you know, James, uh, in about an hour and a half, Adam will be up and we'll be doing we'll be having a book club which we have on Sunday nights. We're reading a book called Ukraine: The Forging of a Nation by a Ukrainian scholar um, from Lviv, Yaroslav Fritsak. But one of the points he makes, and it astounds me that I never knew this until the last couple of years, and I think many of us are in the same boat, that Ukraine has been the center of um, great movements in history for centuries. The First World War, um, it, it was, it was uh, the, a, lot of the, a lot of what was going on really was who was going to, who was going to have control over Ukraine and over, over its fields and over it, the, what it could produce and its, its um, minerals. Second World War, Hitler before the war even said, if they, as long as the Germany could take over Ukraine, they basically would win the war and they would be you know, supplied for all time. Um, Ukraine has had a pivotal role for a long time, and it certainly, as James was alluding to uh, now, you know, it's certainly this is where the battle for the future is taking place. And I don't think it's I don't think it's hyperbole to say the battle for the future of the world, certainly the battle for the future of a free Europe, um, is taking place on on the fields of of, of Eastern Ukraine at this point, and. Um, you know, and we are we we all should be invested in this because it's all we all um, you know we all stand to lose mightily if Ukraine loses the whole world loses. I mean, God forbid it should never even happen. Um, but uh, you know, I think that that's something we have to we have to uh, acknowledge, and I I think it's becoming clearer to. Uh, well, for example, Emmanuel Macron, I was astounded today, James, I saw an article that said over 50% of French youth, the people who would serve in the military, if, it, if the case, case, if they had to, over 50% said that they would be, they would be willing to go to Ukraine to fight to protect France. 
I thought that was astonishing. Um, and, it, and the whole, the whole, uh, the role that France is suddenly playing in all of this has just blown me away. Um, I think we're we're seeing all sorts of uh, realignments. We certainly are seeing a greater appreciation for the countries of Eastern Europe, who we, I mean, at least I never knew much about. It was all sort of, you know, the, the Warsaw Pact, you know, all these. They're all sort of the same, which they're not. And the Baltics. Um, so I think we're going to come out of this uh, with uh, significantly redrawn lines of uh, of uh, influence and importance in the world and ukraine is going to be at the center of that so i just you know it's it's been for me it's been a year of of uh, a couple of years of really learning a lot about the world that i i thought i was well educated before but i definitely was not anyway and now i'm waffling so back to you james <laughs> <laughs> let's switch to pancakes they flip pretty well um no you know what you said is really important that uh, the world really is realigning, and I hope that they're serious and it's more than just words. I did, you know, I think I mentioned this yesterday about the Prime Minister of Spain talking about the need to, you know, pick up spe uh, on defense spending. And they're far below the um, 2% that's been set out as a target, and so they've got a ways to go. So in terms of the deeds versus words, um, there, there's a gap there, and but at least he's speaking about it. And then I think it's going to be um, similar to the United States. It's up to more than just um, the prime minister to get this moving. It'll take other people uh, to, you know, to uh, engage and the representatives to vote for aid packages, and then actually to do it, and hopefully also expand their production capacities like other nations have. And uh, this is something which, you know, 20 years ago, we, we were not having this discussion. We were having other ones about the defense budget, right? And um, it, it was, there was a felt need then that we had to battle terror. And indeed we did. Uh, but there was also the felt sense that we didn't have to worry about nations going to war with nations. And um, well, now we can look back and say, oh, that was stupid. Uh, and it's easy to say that um, in retrospect, but what's clear is that uh, we should probably um, be prepared to spend, um, you know, spend into the future more than what we think is necessary because that is the best way to fight, is to fight through deterrence. And so to have extra armaments, extra munition, uh, as opposed to doing what Ukraine did, and that is getting plunged into a very large war, uh, it's pretty easy to see that that's the expensive route, not necessarily a big defense budget, but to have all the damages that are accumulating. And um, yeah, I, I think that, that the damages will approach or surpass a trillion dollars inside Ukraine. Uh, I'm, I don't know what the last figures are. I know I heard some not so long ago about estimates, but uh, it's a tremendous cost. And uh, it, it's just, it's the expensive route, you know? Uh, it's why we get car insurance, isn't it? It'd be cheaper to go without it. Uh, it's why, you know, why it's a stupid example, but it's why we might carry the uh, umbrella in the rain too. It, you don't need it anymore once the sun starts shining, but you're happy if uh, it starts raining. And uh, this is the same kind of thing. So the, the insurance policy is there for us. Uh, but only if we spend for it. Yeah, and and you know, at least we have the option of of getting an insurance policy or being idiotic and not insuring ourselves. Ukraine was sitting there minding its own business. I mean, they tried to get insurance. They tried in 2014, and and uh, with through because of Russian the uh, because of Russian uh, 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 interference, they uh, you know they uh, Yanukovych ended up not signing the association agreement with the EU. They've been trying for, you know, they were they were trying, they were not trying to get into into NATO until after 2014 when the invasion into the Donbass and Crimea started. But they have been trying ever since then to uh, to get insurance from the West, from the from Europe, Europe and the United States to make them strong enough that the Russians wouldn't dare to invade. And they unfortunately were not able to do that. They they tried their best and we just didn't come through. 
Um, those of us, uh, the countries that have signed the Budapest Memorandum uh, have really no excuse for that. But, you know, I was thinking, um, James, one of the things that we certainly have seen in the last couple of years is, is the incredible ability the Ukrainians have to start with nothing and build something from it. I just see, saw an article here from uh, Ukrainska Pravda that 99% um, of drones being used on the front line are now Ukrainian made. That's an incredible thing. I mean, they have ramped up the, uh, their, uh, their production astronomically. I mean, it's really, and they're saying now, um, they're quoting uh, Colonel Vadim Sukharevsky, who's the deputy commander in chief of the armed forces, that they're already, they already have 1200 kilometer uh, drones and that, that that isn't a limit that there, there, there are definitely longer range drones uh, in development that he's sort of coy about it, maybe already being used. Um, but, uh, you know, this is, uh, so the, the, these other countries that can't seem to get itself together, I was thinking, you know, maybe we should, we should have, I've got another idea for another land lease. I think maybe Ukraine could loan out, loan out Alexander Commission for a month to Spain to get them in, to get them on the right track. And then he can, well, I wouldn't really, I wouldn't want Commission to be out of Ukraine, but, you know, maybe we can clone, hey, in one of the bio labs, let's make 10 Commission clones and we can send them to all these countries that don't seem to be able to get their acts together. What do you think, James? I like it. I like it a lot. That's great. Um, yeah, it's it's really super impressive. And uh, I was listening to mockers the other night talk about the Baba Yaga drone. That is, uh, it's a carrier drone. It it is uh, like the aircraft carrier that it gets the aircraft there, where they can then um, use that their entire range, uh, and they haven't spent any energy getting to the front, they now can spend all their energy, all their battery power uh, doing what they do best, which is hunt down and destroy uh, you, uh, Russians. And um, that's okay in Russian equipment. And that's great. So it's, um, this is just one of the examples that we know about that uh, is innovative, really has never been used in the world before. And the fact that we are talking about it means that it's getting to be old hat. Uh, you know what I mean? And they are um, constantly going to be pushing the boundaries of what's possible. Uh, you know, speaking of drones, I'm still thinking about that golf cart one that drove up under the bridge um, and uh, then blew up the, the little bridge. I'm sure you saw that. Um, that's another example of an innovation uh, and it, you know, built to purpose, right? I mean, it really, they probably don't have too many situations where there's that low of a bridge uh, where they do this. Um, but, you know, they, they said, Hey, <laughs> Chuck's line, right? Why send in uh, troops if uh, you can send in a drone? I mean, that's not exactly what he says, but you know, he says talks about a hand grenade. I think uh, more often, but nonetheless, the point remains the same: that this is uh, another way that Ukraine is protecting its soldiers from getting hurt. And uh, so, this is um, it, it's kind of exciting. Kind of, I can nerd out a little bit about drones. Uh, but what's clear is they've become a mainstay for uh, Ukrainian forces, and they're absolutely uh, deadly tools of war. And uh, it's it's a little bit scary. And some of the the um, videos I've seen and and stills as well of Russian forces, uh, you know, facing down. Uh, a drone one-on-one -on -one are really kind of disturbing uh, because, um, you know, it's like a, a, a big bumblebee. And if you're allergic, um, that can be really dangerous. And you, But these ones, you don't get a chance to swat it down. Uh, you know, it comes after you. If it hits you, uh, well, it's a it's, um, good night. And uh, that, that um, gives me... Um, well, I guess satisfaction that they're well protected, and uh, I'm I'm delighted that they're getting this kind of equipment up and going. And it's uh, there. There's more to come, and the really long range stuff. We'll see. Uh, I was, <laughs> Mockers was also talking about some of the uh, ways that birds maintain. Or no, it was pickled flicker fella. I think who was talking about this? How birds maintain, um, you know, 
themselves in the air using the currents in the air to get more elevation and then fly on to whatever they're going to do. And uh, can can drones do that? Well, I don't know. But, uh, you know, if they're thinking about it, they're probably able to do it. So it's it's just one innovation after another. And that's just the drones because they've also got a whole array of other weapon systems um, that they recently showed off sort of at a a weapons show. So other people are already interested in uh, in what they're producing. I don't know how much exports they're going to do at this point, though, Robin. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously, they, there's a limit to what what they can afford to export at this point. But people are standing up and taking notice, you know. Remember, uh, uh, Tim, before, we, or get, was it yesterday, uh, where they were talking with someone about, uh, you know, about... Uh, this is, there's a problem in Estonia apparently now. There's a shortage of plumbers. Why? Because there were a lot of the plumbers in Estonia were Ukrainians. And they all went back to Ukraine when the war started. Um, and the the, the uh, you know I, it, I and I see I suspect that in in Russia too part of their technological problem too is they used to be a lot of Ukrainians who worked in Russia. Obviously they're not working there now. And that was a brain brain trust that they uh, that they uh, have foregone. Serves them right, I must say. Um, but I mean, I think the the, the flexibility and the, and the diversification that the Ukrainians are able to do in a military that's not so far away from that Soviet command line sort of model of you know the commands from the top. It's it's really a te- it's a testament first of all to uh, the ability to pivot, and it also I think really really is indicative of the difference between Ukrainians and Russians. Ukrainians were never have never in history have never been willing to go in lockstep um you know they they have been they have been uh, persecuted and been treated badly and been ruled by russians but it was never they never really bought into it um and uh with uh, oh I, yeah i was gonna say with the with the drones too um i think at, you know at this point thank god for these drones they're never going to win a war with drones but i think the drones have managed to minimize the damage that would otherwise be being done by not having sufficient ammunition um, it's not enough by it's the drones, as I said, it, it's never going to win a war with drones, but I think they have managed to protect their people and to minimize, uh, you know, the amount of land that they've been losing uh, in, in this in this uh, in this weapons drought. So that's another important thing. And, you know, it's it's funny. I was thinking, you know, after the Moskva was was uh, was uh, turned into a submarine. Uh, there were all these memes, you know, where we were saying, you know, wait a minute, wait a minute. Do you, you mean to tell me that that uh, your your navy was just sunk by a country who ha- that has no navy? And I, you know, I think we're seeing with uh, with the uh, aircraft losses that you that uh, Russia has suffered in the last couple of months. Uh, Ukraine is also uh, getting to the, you know, is is uh, is bringing down a good part of the Russian air force without really having an air force to match them at this point. Hopefully, they will have one soon. But at this point, um, you know, they 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 uh, repeatedly level the playing field with what they've got because they don't have. Um, you know they don't have the kind of uh, of weaponry that any NATO country would would uh, would would uh, not even think about. It would be obvious that you need this, and they somehow have managed. Uh, it's not we can't rely on that. We have to get them the weaponry that they need. But it's a real testament to what Ukrainians are are, and you know their 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 uh, civic culture, their uh, you know their ability to. Uh, to just hang on and do what needs to be done, I, it's 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 a very admirable quality. Um, I I posted in the in the uh, in the uh, back channel a couple of days ago um, an interview, and it's in my Twitter uh, Twitter feed, an interview that President Zelensky gave with a group of college students in Chernihiv, and I you know I was we've talked a lot on the space about you know we're, we're we try to be sort of cheerleaders for Ukraine, but at the same time, obviously. It does nobody any good if we just, uh, you know, if we just are mindlessly optimistic about everything. Things are not so good right now, and it's important to acknowledge that also. But I was, in watching this interview with President Zelensky, uh, these students asked him difficult questions. They obviously weren't, you know, prepared in advance. He obviously didn't have canned answers to give them. He spoke from his heart and, you know, off the cuff very powerfully and really connecting with them. But the thing I got out of it was, 
um, he's very realistic about what is going on, but at the same time, he has something I've, I've, I've searched around for words to describe it. I can't, I came, I, I settled on relentless optimism. He is relentlessly optimistic about the future of Ukraine. Uh, he's not, not minimizing any of the challenges he faces right now, but he, he is planning for the future. He was telling the students what will be, um, you know, what will be after the war, that there'll be a lot of work to do, but that it will be done and things will, you know, will end up being better than, than they were before. And I think that that's, I think all of us need to, uh, work on adopting that that those two those two those two traits being realistic but being relentlessly optimistic um it's hard for me i get i get down sometimes and i i get down on myself because i've got i've got no right to get down i'm sitting here in, in brooklyn i'm perfectly safe and um you know it's 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 not i don't I have no business feeling down although i think it gets to anybody who is a caring person but i will i i've, I've bookmarked this speech by President Zelensky, which I, or this interview, which I will bring up every few days, like I used to do with his New Year's uh, address from the, from a year ago, a year and a half ago now, um, to, uh, you know, that will, uh, that to, re to remind me of exactly what we're doing here. And what we're doing is we're, we are working so that Ukraine will win and so that Ukraine will be able to build better than ever. And, uh, you know, that's the thing to keep our, keep our, keep our eyes on the prize, as they say. Back to you, James. Uh, you know what? Those those two traits, um, the you know, realistic and optimism, are th things that work across uh, anybody's life. Um, it isn't just if you're fighting a war; they really can help you. And and I think that we've all grown to understand that somewhat. But uh, and you you got your mic open. I don't know if you knew that, Robin. But no, anyway, I didn't. Sorry, as I'm gulping uh, coffee here. <laughs> at, <laughs> no problem. It's not the worst thing I've heard on there. Um, or, you know, whatever. But anyways, um, yeah, no, this is the way to be. And uh, he's a model for us all. And uh, I think I told you before that I have um, used him uh, in my imagery to have him sitting in the chair uh, and talking to me sometimes. Uh, that would be Zelensky. Uh, and it, uh, I found it motivational that he's like, you know, and this was book club related, um, that, yeah, it's like, you know, in his gravelly voice, he'd say things like, uh, you know, so have you finished the chapter yet, James, and uh, things like that. And, um, you know, it's a little bit, um, a, maybe a little strange, but I did find it motivating because it reminded me that behind that image is a whole nation that really does need the world's help. And, uh, and has so much uh, to give back to the world, which I think is the, the great thing about this, is that this is not going to be a one-way exchange. And, uh, you know, I keep going back to the UN speech that he made uh, way back when, and when he talked about Ukraine uh, paying back uh, in, you know, in the benefits of being a good partner to democracies around the world. And I think that's really something that uh, we can count on if we can bring them to victory. And we certainly can if we're able to get them the right armaments and supplies. I think that that's, that's what will happen. That's what the future will look like. And I think with Ukraine at our side as an ally, as part of NATO, I think that uh, we'll be uh, in a very strong place in the world and better able to defend ourselves than ever before. And not just because, uh, you know, of who they are, but also because um, they ha will have defeated Russia at that point. And that's going to have to give Russia a lot of pause before they try anything else. And also, the Ukrainian victory will spark other nations, ex well, soon to be ex-Soviet nations, uh, to you know, take their own path to wherever they want to go away from Russia. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure these are the things that um, keep Putin up at night worrying about. And uh, that's good if he's worrying about it. I'm very happy about that. Uh, I don't believe for a second that, uh, you know, we'll have to take a defeat, as the Russian ambassador said. I believe that was the Russian ambassador to the UN who talked about um, the you know, the next time we gather or something like this, you know, you'll be accepting, uh, you know, 
Kiev's, you'll have to accept that Kiev is giving up to us. And, you know, that'll be, uh, it's like, no. And, and it, but it's interesting when you listen to them carefully, you realize just how full of crap they are. Not because that uh, is a completely irresponsible claim, but because it really gives lie to the fact that they wanted to stop a genocide. And now it's uh, turning out that it's, oh, it's really about taking over the whole nation and making it a part of Russia. And so, you know, it, it, when they talk, uh, we should listen, uh, we could learn things. But I have been informed that, uh, that I, I should probably try to keep to our time schedule for uh, swapping out co-hosts, Robin. And I see that uh, my replacement is here. So I'm going to take the opportunity to say Slava Ukraini and tell you how much I have enjoyed your company and everybody else who's come up to speak and to all the listeners for doing what you do, not only listening, but uh, doing uh, the calls, donating money and, uh, you know, supporting us um, with moral support and tweeting and replying and boosting and all those things. So you guys uh, have a great evening. I unfortunately am engaged with taxes tonight. Uh, tax day tomorrow. Uh, anyway, but it's, it must be done. Otherwise, how are we going to fund Ukraine? Yeah, okay. Hello, <laughs> Slava. Yeah, thank, thank you, James. I do appreciate you paying your taxes. Boy, you don't, you don't, you don't wait for the last minute or anything, do you? I'll tell you something. Never. I fought, I filed last week, and I'm really annoyed. The, the federal government took their their last little bit of blood out of my account on Friday. They couldn't even wait till the fifteenth. I'm really annoyed. <laughs> but anyway. Um, yeah, I think, you know, one of one of the things that is definitely going to happen um, is, you know, once once Ukraine is given what it needs and they're able to to drive Russia back out and put Russia, you know, back in the boxes, the entire world is going to be safer. I mean, we see again what's happening in, in Israel. The Israelis, God bless them, are very clear um, as to, uh, you know, as to who's behind this, you, that that the. Uh, you know, it may be, Iran may be the the, uh, the intermediary cause there, but it's the Russians who are behind all of this. And, you know, most, I, a good good percentage of the bad things going on in the world can be traced back to Russia. There's a lot going on in Africa, bad stuff. Um, certainly with the, the shenanigans in our, in our election, election system in the United States, uh, we certainly don't need that. Um, so, it's you know it, it this this with the entire world stands to benefit which is why people should get their you know as t tim would say pull their thumb out and get th get things get things going um you know the other thing you're talking about um uh about uh the 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 expectations the russians had and still purport to have about how they're going to win um it it shows it shows that they just don't uh they still don't know who they're dealing with. I mean, they still don't. Anybody who knows Ukrainians knows as long as there's one Ukrainian left in Iraq, they're not gonna. They're not gonna give up. They're not gonna uh, to uh, to. Uh, they're not gonna give give up, give in to, to Russia. I mean, it's just ridiculous. I and mean, they should have. They should have figured that out in 2014, in in Donbas, when they thought they were gonna send in a little force and have all these Russian-speaking Ukrainians come come join them and to, to fight against the you know the Kiev regime. As they said, it didn't happen. But it just shows that the, the blindness that ideology can cause that they still are they still are com are committed to this completely bogus idea of how the world works and who they're dealing with. I mean, anybody with 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 their eyes open would say, you know, Russia, you don't have a chance. You know, go home before you. They're destroying themselves too, at this point. But anyway, enough of my rant. Uh, I would like to uh, say uh, say uh, good good evening. Um, Adam is up to join me. Dobry uh, večer. How are you? Dobry večer, Robin. Very good. How are you doing? Jak sprave? Uh, ch <laughs> How are you doing? Yeah, they just don't learn, do they? It's uh, it's it's rather aggravating, and uh, they can't seem to get it through their heads that we're different folks than them. And they make it more that way every second of this war. I feel less and less 
of a brotherly kinship, if you can call what's the decrepit little coal in the corner of my heart that uh, is no longer functioning. <laughs> it's no longer, uh, it's just getting smaller and smaller, Robin. No, well, I mean, that whole brotherly nations business was a crock from the get go, but certainly anybody who bought into that on the Ukrainian side of the border has certainly been disabused of that by now. Um, you know, I was thinking maybe we should maybe we should get, you know, several thousand copies of Fritzsack and, and drop them on the Kremlin. Uh, they wouldn't read it, though. They wouldn't learn from that either. I mean, it's it's you know, they would burn them. Yeah, well, that's true. Yes, that's true. Even if they were in Russian. Because they're Nazis. <laughs> Not to throw the N-word around, the, the, mind, the other N-word. Yeah, no, but it, it is, I mean, they, they, they're... I mean, they are because I mean, and that's that isn't just throwing a word around. The you know the Ruski Mir uh, ideology is based on not only on fascist ideology, but uh, you know this this the reprehensible Alexander Dugin is one of uh, uh, one of the Putin whispers and all of this. His philosophy is is stone. It's pretty much whole cloth from. Um, uh, a, a German Nazi uh, ideologue whose name I can never remember. It's Schmidt. I think it's Schmitz or Schmidt. Anyway, uh, uh, Ivan Ilin. Well, Ivan Ilin is before he was guy? Russian. Yeah, and Ivan Ilin also. But no, there was a. Uh, I have to look it up again. Uh, Timothy Snyder. I think I've mentioned you, Adam, when I was when, in one of my many. Two Former lives. I I cataloged uh, former lives. Chilling was the fact that these looked almost exactly the same as the German dissertations that I had been cataloging. You know, same as the German dissertations that I had been cataloging. You know, contemporary German dissertations. The same. These scientific treatises are, they sound totally reasonable until you step back a little bit and say, wait a minute, we're, we're, uh, we're less, uh, you know, we're less. It. I mean, it's, it's nauseating stuff. I haven't read very much, but I read a little, little bit in translation. All you have to do is go through and uh, just wherever it says Ukrainian, stick Jew, and wherever it says Russia, stick German, and it's a whole cloth from from Nazi ideology. I think it is too, especially in light of those philosophers and how much uh, Huila Elected, elected representatives and in you know that's your new angle and light of 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 the attacks Lovely CC, deeds not words, uh, tweet. And so there's your list. 
my Americano muchachos get up there and phone away, right, Robin? Yes, absolutely. I have even been phoning my, uh, I've even been phoning my senator who has nothing to do with this, just on general principles. And my representative who, thank God, signed on to the discharge position quite a while ago. But yeah, keep it, keep it going. Even people, even if you, even if you're fortunate to have somebody who has done the right thing, give them continuing support. Uh, ask them to please try to reach out to non, non-committed, uh, you know, colleagues of theirs to, uh, you know, because they, they have, they have the ear of some of these people in a way that we don't. Um, to get, we're getting very close to the finish line here, um, to the point that uh, that guy whose name I don't remember, and what do I care? Because I don't, uh, the speaker of the House, Johnson, um, he's talking about how they're gonna, you know, they're gonna they're gonna get bill on the floor next week to get funding for Ukraine and for Israel. Uh, I don't think he has any intention of actually getting anything done, but the fact that he's saying that shows that he's getting a little worried about the fact that he may. Um, you know that he may be, uh, he may be, uh, he may. This may be another loss for him, which I certainly hope. He may be complicit in the Iran's attack on Israel. I don't know. Is that a little strong? <laughs> oh, I don't. Yeah, actually, I, I don't know if I would have said that, but but yeah, I mean, certainly, uh, certainly, um, this is very convenient for Russia. In in you know, I mean, none of this stuff happens by chance. You know, it's it's uh, this right right when this is about to go go over the line. Uh, they have to get the get the uh, get the emphasis, you know, back on Israel again to get people's mind off of Ukraine, um, you know. And and I, you know, it, it's funny though. It's I mean, they. It's not funny. I mean, it's it's weird. The Russians are their own worst uh, worst uh, propaganda sometimes because one of the things that President Zelensky pointed out, and he's not the only one, was that um, in fact the Institute for the Study of War points out that the uh, that the tactics that that Iran is using with the drones and everything are ex- are suspiciously similar to the way the Russians have been attacking Ukraine. Uh, I mean, suspicious to the point of there, you know, there obviously was there obviously was some uh, uh, serious communication going on about about tactics and that kind Collusion. of thing. Collusion. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, it's again making making the point that this is all one war. It's two different two different battlefields, but it's all the same thing. And if, you know, Russia, if Russia was out of, off of the, off of the, uh, out of the picture, then Israel would be safer. Ukraine obviously would be safer. The rest of the world would be safer. So, um, you know, it's, I, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that, uh, I'm hoping that, that those, those holdouts, you know, the real ideologues in the, in the House of Representatives, I mean, they're, they're beyond help, but there are people who just have not, taken a stand yet i just i just hope that this shakes a few of them loose we don't need that many more at this point and um you know we just have to get this over the line get the get the get the get the weaponry flowing again ukraine has done amazingly well holding the line but how much longer can we expect them to be able to do this they're starting to i mean i think chasiv yar is is they're still holding on, but it's not going to, you know, it's it's a danger point now, and there's going to come a point where they may not be able to unless they, you can't fight a war without without weapons, correct? Last time I checked, um, they have not developed any sort of psycho, uh, psychic uh, powers that they could just, uh, you know, use on the Russians, the, the, the Russians. Pardon my uh, speech there, Robin. Um, yeah, uh, I think it, it, it the, that silent majority right now in Congress is kind of like the si- silent majority in our societies right now. They they aren't paying attention and as much as they should be to this subject. And yeah, like you said, and hopefully this wakes them up to it. And, and I would say this. Yeah, this. In our democracies to sort of realize that this is this is on that has not has become unsubbed.
hit me up and uh when he was co-hosting and, and speaking with gunny about um up time to stand up for everybody get out there you know phone your representatives but i would say talk to as many people in your real life as you can without being annoying or of being annoying and uh and you can get and uh had some people here and there say yeah well, yeah i will uh i will call the defense minister's office here in canada and such like that so yeah, that's part of it too, folks. Yeah, that. You running into every day. I had an experience. Bumper sticker and I've got the pins on my jacket and the t-shirt. The day, you know, I, uh, I was a button on my on my coat, and she looks. That's exactly like, you know, in World War II, people saying, oh, we can't wear. Same time. People not, I mean, everyone should be outraged at outraged at this. I mean, the hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian kids have been torn away from their families and their country. The boys are uh, are at risk of being mobilized in the Russian military to fight against their own country. Um, and it, it it doesn't seem to resonate with, with people. And we talk about it all the time here, but it's, um, you know, people just don't, they're just not, they just, people don't know. I mean, it's just amazing. And, you know, we're talking about that. We, you know, I talked about you know, the fact that, no, this is not, a, they're not both sides. In this, this is, this is a one country. And the other country is determined to wipe them off the face of the earth. This is not, you know, this is not one side and the other other and this these were concepts she had never heard you know she France because they're just not the same people. And uh, but this was this was news to this woman and she's a good woman. She's but this really um she really had understood um what the situation was. Now is she gonna go um
But also I bring this up because all of you who are listening here, you in your own, in your own, um, in your own circles of the people you run into every day. They talking to the person behind me, you know, but you know, when you're talking to people, this, this can come in a conversation and you can really make, we can all make incremental differences in the world. And when you add all that together, it can make a really, really big difference. Your mouth, when you're talking to other people, you don't, you know, I I try not to be obnoxious. My son, my son still says, I make a big difference. And yeah, it's very important. I think people. People are, I think, definitely keeps it, uh, yeah. Nothing boils my blood like that. Nothing boils my blood like that. Oh, that's still going on? Comment? Like, oh. <laughs> to properly earlier when I first came up, um, you and James came up. of the full-scale invasion, I find out more and more. These, all of it, that have never stopped. You know, the the MAGA influence, you know, the, the MAGA influence, the influence of conspiracy theorist. Because, you know, friends and strangers in your life about it. But stick to those key concepts. Robin was smart. To the uh, kidnapping of the children and the war crimes and that sort of thing and the genocidal intent I think uh, I think uh, among Jewish so I think it's a good way so so tailor your your thoughts to what individual what the person you're talking to right like you can always find an angle and stay calm <laughs> this is mostly my uh my uh my uh advice to my own cossack part of ukraine that you've seen amongst Jews that you know, Jews that you know, is it, is it kind of uh, uh, and I wonder if I, I just, when you're telling that story, it made me think of that and think if that's part of what we have to overcome that uh, ancient Soviet propaganda and part of the active measures woman who was talking about she was saying that she hopes all the ukrainians who are killed were had 
had had were ha- you know had had anti-Semitism in their blood, and they were related to all these all those terrible Ukrainians who killed these millions of Jews. They, which is not you know it's historically not accurate, but you know. And I said to her, I said, what you're doing is you 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 sound like a Nazi. What are you talking about in the blood? Nobody in Ukraine now was involved in the pogroms, you know, in in 200 years ago. And but I think as you're saying, a lot of there. Um, Rabbi, Rabbi Bleich, who's one of the two chief rabbis of Ukraine, I think this is very funny. This is t- typical, typically Jewish. The two people who seem to work together, but they different groups consider them chief rabbis of Ukraine. But Rabbi Bleich, who comes from my, my neck of the woods, Brooklyn, has lived in Ukraine for almost 40 years. At least a year ago, uh, an interview. Two things. One of which he said, you know, he'd always respected Ukrainians, but with the start of the full-scale invasion, when he seen how, with the start of the full-scale invasion, when he seen how people came together and helped each other, and and you know, and, and united, that he now loves the Ukrainian. Said, which I think is very important, was he said the decades. It was really a bad couple of decades uh, between Ukrainians and Jews. There's no question about it. But he said, but that was an aberration. That was a short period of time. He said, in Russia, the Jews, Semites trope is a piece of Russian. Even the ones that are but there was a certainly the Russians have managed to hang pogroms and discrimination that was done by one hundred percent Russians on on Ukraine also, but it's part of this whole rewriting of history. Everything good that happened, for example, it was the Russians who defeated the Nazis. Um, forget about those millions of Ukrainian troops. I mean, as you know, I was surprised to find a few months ago, the, the uh, Red Army group that, that liberated Auschwitz was Ukrainian. It was not, they were not Russians. Um, and think of, of 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 the Germans' reticence to uh, to give Ukraine the weaponry that they've asked for. To we're in the in the in the in the front lines fighting with the Germans than than uh, than Russians, but long answer of a short. <laughs> it should have been short. Yeah, I. In the more Ukrainian part of the Soviet Union, um, it's it, they have managed. Um, it's it, they have managed to warp the warp the story to uh, to hang a lot of this on Ukrainians. One of the things we're going to find today against all this is why why were so many the Pale of Settlement that they called it that strip of, of that area. Um, why? Why? Because the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was welcoming of they they welcomed diversity. They welcomed people of different religions. 
religious groups. They, that's why Jews ended up there, not because because of surrounding the, the surrounding parts of Europe. So. points and uh, and I would also say part of that bad 20s 30s 40s time between Ukrainians and Jews the, the end part of it was when the Nazis occupied Ukraine and then they started advertised their Goebbels and all of them. And in those times were, were, um, encouraged in the least by the Nazi regime. Yeah, 100%. One, one of the other things, too, that people, I mean, it's, it's, it was a bad time, and I think it was people not to, you know, not, not in a large the larger uh, scope. This is one of the calls a global history of Ukraine, which really brings in a lot more of what well the surrounding um it was understandable that some Ukrainians would see them as as their saviors. This would see parties. This was not ten years later that the, that that or just about ten years later that the that, and in fact I know that um, many Jews when when the war started they fled. When when the war started, they fled to the West. They tried to flee to Germany because they thought the Germans were much more civilized and cultured than the Russians. The Russian, the Ukrainians, and the Jews understand it, you know, until we really dig into it. I think a good source for that is Bloodlands. I know you have and uh, it's it's oof, it's a tough listen. But you got to do it. Take three Xanax and get it on Audible, Robin. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And maybe I'll bring that with me to Ukraine this summer. I'll bring one book, then I'll have to read it. Yeah, I, I read, what is the other, his other, um, uh, what was, I, I, was it, was it Bloodlands? No, actually, it's an extremely important. I just couldn't, I couldn't read any more. I mean, the heart. Uh, but as you're saying, it's a very important book. Ilka. 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'll, you don't have to read it. I'll, I'll tell you about it. But we'll leave out the terrible parts. I don't know what I'm saying. Um, it's uh, it's a good one. Um, and yeah, Snyder's histories always come back to my mind through lots of this stuff that we talk about. Um, you know, maybe from a historical sense, but also from a democratic and preserving democracy sense. Two, um, do you have anything uh, before book club here, Robin, that uh, you were looking to uh, to read or, or uh, talk about? I don't particularly. I ended up coming up a lot earlier than I expected to. So the, you know, the little bit of preparation I would have done. Let me just take a look at my bookmarks here uh, to see if they had, if there are any, there's any news we haven't uh, discussed. Otherwise, I may see what you have to say. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, well, President Zelensky, yeah, I, I mentioned this. They, he, he draws parallels between Iranian and Russian tactics in recent attacks, which, you know, this is not a surprise to any of us. But I don't, I think I've got, this is a short list today. Um, and yeah, I'm afraid, I'm afraid I'm pretty well, much tapped one. out. Good. I'm glad I thought you might. Uh, you know, Todd, tell you folks, when you're co-hosting, it's really good to have a co-host who works with you who's better prepared than you are. Oh, are you, Adam? Well, you're the one who spends all that time on the notes, and then I put in my little, uh, my little two cents. So I think, uh, I think we're more than square on that front. Um, whoa, hey, James, you got a hand there. Got a hand. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, I found out that I had laundry and uh, some other tasks uh, ahead of my taxes. So uh, anyway, um, it but what it gave me a chance to do was uh, give my attention to this. And so you guys were talking about it. And uh, I want you to know that I'm, I'm making quite a dent into um, the Gates of Europe book uh, and, and enjoying it. It's a little bit... Uh, pretty vast in terms of the amount of time uh, that that they cover. So uh, it's interesting. Um, and so I have put down my other books. I had a stack of four books that I was kind of round robining on. <clears throat> and I, after I told you guys that the last time, I said, I'm going to change. I'm going to do this a chapter at a time. But then that turned into two chapters for that book. So anyways, and then you said it's a good listen, Bloodlands. Well, okay, so I went to the Libby app, and I said, maybe maybe it'll be available. Well, it is available. And so now I can get to the other thing that I really need to do, and that is go out and get some exercise before I uh, start in on taxes, because I realized I'm, I'm a little bit behind, and I've had oh, plenty of food today, so I need it. Anyways, you guys, uh, thank you for doing book club tonight. I'm going to listen as I can. Uh, and uh, I'll, you know, at some point I'll catch up with all the books I've got stacked up. But one of them is probably as bad as uh, Bloodlands or worse, and that is uh, Samantha Powers' A Problem from Hell. Um, <clears throat> not part of the book club, but um, something I think is, is uh, going to be a necessary read. Uh, to really go on and understand uh, genocide better. So anyways, you guys, uh, keep it up. I uh, love it that you guys are doing it together. Uh, you guys work well. So uh, looking forward to hearing what I can of it. Have a, so again, I say goodbye. You just can't get rid of me that easy. Okay, oh, thank you, James. Well, and and you as an emeritus uh, book club uh, co-host, I'm very grateful to you too for the books that we did together. Uh, it does get exhausting after a while, I guess. <laughs> but um, yeah, that what? Wait, you had just mentioned what was what was the book James just mentioned? Oh, the Samantha Power book. Whoa, not only about genocide, but about our miserable lack of appropriate response to one genocide after the other. I have, I've, I only, Heather, Prince Heather recommended this book to me. Um, I have a lot of trouble dealing with the genocide, uh, the genocide program that she has on Friday nights. I usually can't listen to a lot of it. And that's, that's my failing. But this book is like that too. It's on my bookshelf, but it's going to take me quite a while to be able to get through it because it just, it, it's horrifying. I mean, the I, the fact of genocide is horrifying enough. And the fact that, I mean, after the Holocaust, you know, we said never again. And, you know, you begin to wonder, did that mean anything? 
I mean, what does that mean? Well, never again are the Nazis going to kill Jews. Well, yeah, obviously that's not going to happen again. But if, if I mean, for example, I mean, what's going on in Ukraine? That's a, that's a genocide. If we, you know, if we don't, if we can't respond appropriately to that, then then never again means absolutely nothing. And that I find very depressing. Yeah, back to you, James. Yeah, you know, one of the things I've learned in in listening in and participating in uh, the Understanding Genocide segment is that um, we learned a lot about the Holocaust, right? Uh, capital T, capital H. Uh, but we didn't learn a lot about what uh, genocide really is when it's broken down into its parts. And um, so I think that we are unprepared as citizens to recognize what genocide is until we learn, um, you know, what the law is that covers it, uh, how, what is required to get a conviction, and uh, what are the elements of genocide. And then also, as we've also been learning, what are these obstacles to getting uh, to use the genocide law? And uh, even in our space, uh, um, I saw some of the evidence for genocide um, being talked about as human trafficking. And, and I resented it immediately because I felt like we're, we're almost reducing the charges. And then on the other hand, I guess I've held since the very beginning is, um, well, to paraphrase uh, so a slang phrase, um, you know, uh, charge them with everything and let God or the court sort it out. Um, you know, and I, so I want them to get uh, imprisoned. I want these people to go to jail, to suffer, uh, but mainly to stop doing what they're doing. And um, we can't really, uh, we know something's wrong, for example, in Gaza, Israel. We know it's wrong. Uh, we can feel it's wrong. Sure, kids dying. There's some kids dying there, uh, just like in Ukraine. Somehow that matters more there. But when we examine it and we break it down, and I think you guys are knowledgeable enough to know what I mean, when you really break down the law and the evidence that's coming out of the region and the initial um, finding in the case that uh, Ukraine, or I'm sorry, Israel should not be restrained from further combat. So they let them continue with what they're doing, which should be uh, like a, a bullhorn um, shouting what the problem is there. And, uh, you know, so we're, we are plagued with misunderstanding and uh, it comes largely now from being misled. And so I, I uh, hope everybody comes to an understanding about what it is, basically what its parts are so that we can all better recognize it and share that understanding with others. Because we need to, um, the, 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 there's two big lies covering um, these two wars, and uh, they're both about genocide, the one on the, the lie on the part of the Russians saying that the uh, Ukrainians are doing that in the Donbass, and then another is that uh, South Africa got up and said, oh, no, you guys are killing, it's genocide, and uh, not showing any evidence of uh, the intent part of that. No, not at all. And you say, well, it's just, you know, the proof is in the pudding, look, see? And that's just not how that intent part works. It's not uh, that there's dead people, therefore it's genocide or everything would be a genocide because uh, with genocide, the number of people killed is not necessarily, um, you know, more or less evidence based on the number of people killed. For example, I can think of the guy that was the shooter. Was it in New York? I believe it was. Uh, and he was intent on killing, having, uh, or at least he desired to have all blacks killed. And uh, that very much fit the picture of genocide. But he didn't kill more than, you know, I don't know, if I forget the numbers now, but enough. And But they didn't charge him with that. And uh, I think I understand why, and I can accept it, but... It's it's good that if you understand the law well enough around this, you can kind of help shape the narrative better. So speaking of narratives, um, I have almost talked to you to your hour, and I'm going to go out and start walking and uh, listening, and uh, maybe I'll rejoin the conversation. But anyways, uh, so I got I got a book to listen to at some point. I'm going to have to drop off and listen to that, too. So Murray Report 24-7. It's a problem. It's a problem when you're addicted.
Oh yeah, I, I had I, Maria Port has given me a lot of problems. I mean, one of them too is I have this pile of books. I said I said timers. I, Adam, I don't know. I said hour long timers. One hour I work on my home, my Ukrainian homework, and don't look at the clock and just like put my head down and try to work as fast as I can. And then the next hour I try to read whatever I'm trying. I'm trying to plow through some books to see what we'll be doing next in the book club. And then, but yeah, I can't I can't figure out how to do without sleep because it's an unbelievable waste of time. Um, and and also listening listening to Maria report somehow you can't do that 24 7 to get anything else done but every time I stop listening I, something happens and I, I regret having turned it off so yeah life is rough but I think you know I mean to be serious for a minute what James was saying about about the definition of genocide this I think I think he's got a, a really good point here one of the things that I mean, it's for me, it's the horror of what's going on that makes it very hard for me to to focus on it for too long. But that was that's something that we learned in Holocaust education, too, is that you don't go at people with the horrors because people turn off. Nobody can can uh, can. I mean, nobody with a heart can listen to too much of the horrors and be able to stay engaged your your defense mechanisms kick in to keep yourself from you know from just being drowned by it so i think this is important what james is saying that that by by learning uh the categories exactly what what constitutes a genocide um it 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 makes it possible for us to become much more educated about it and i think at the same time to be able to find ways of um of countering it that you're not going to be able to come up with if you're just overwhelmed by the horror of the thing. So it's, it's a tough, it's a tough, tough, tough issue, but I think, I think he's got a good point there. Back to you, Adam. Yeah, he's got a very good point and it gets thrown around and misinterpreted a lot of times. And, you know, just like anything, it, it gets diluted when it gets used too much. Um, and that was his, that, well, that's, you know, and it, and, and then it gets to a point where nothing seems like it, and it, and it all, it all comes back to Russia, Robin, it all comes back to Russia, the fire hose of, the fire hose of falsehood, I need my tinfoil hat, it's, it's you know, sweaty. It, it, <laughs> No, it really, it re- that's something I find myself, because I remember a couple of years ago thinking that everybody was yelling about how Russia was involved in messing up our elections and everything, that they, that they were a bunch of tinfoil hat conspiracy theorists. So I'm very, I'm very um, cognizant of the fact that I have to be careful not to come off sounding like the people I thought were nuts a couple of years ago, because it turns out, you know, not, not, to, not to give away the plot here, folks, but it turns out that a lot of that tinfoil hat stuff having to do with Russian uh, meddling in internal things in the United States. It turns out a lot of that stuff was actually true, but you've got to be very careful when you're talking to people because once you come off sounding like, like a whack of conspiracy theorists, then you have lost any traction, any, any ability to, to get through to them at all. But it is a constant, it is a constant problem for for me trying to, uh, you know, judge who I'm talking to and exactly how far I can push it uh, because it turns out it is Russia, Russia, Russia. <laughs> it was Russia in the dining room with the lamp holder. They done it. Anyways, enough about the Moscow's. I said, I said their name too many times today. Let's before book club i think there's just enough time to get into this little article i found on ukraine world what do you think terrific go for it okay from ukraineworld.org book market they're great and it's uh ukrainian academics um just banding together fabulous podcasts too really really good podcasts absolutely and if you go to the website there's the podcasts and there's videos The other thing I was going to get to, if we had time, we had such an awesome discussion this hour, was ukrainer.net. Check that one out. Oh, I I love them. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I love both of them, and and it's a great spot for cultural and human interest and uh, historical kind of stuff. If your brain gets 
fried by the by the front line talk a little bit as mine does so here is seven things to know about ukraine's statehood formation journey so i i thought i really like this one and it's um april 13th 2024 from ukraine world and just in time for us to talk about the Kazakhs again in uh in book club so starts out here does ukrainian statehood only span 30 years in fact its origins trace back to the middle ages and evolve through significant historical stages this ukraine's historical narrative spans centuries and is defined by an ongoing struggle for national liberation and statehood ukrainian statehood emerged not only in the 1990s but has roots in the era of kiev of kiev and rus and its continuity can be traced to the present day. Throughout the formation of Ukrainian statehood, notable milestones punctuated transitional phases of interrupted statehood. Have notable milestones punctu punctuated by transitional phases of interrupted statehood have contributed to a cohesive depiction of its development. I just had to start that over again, Robin, because it was just a that went wrong this is what so these, this is what happens when academics write things <laughs> yeah yeah you can tell that yeah it's whew. um anyway so they it's, they always have they've got a lot of these articles it's they've got some of the other ones i'm seeing are 10 things to know about the ukrainian language eight things to know about the ukrainian national movement and this is just the most recent one on ukraineworld.org and they say seven things but i don't know if it's a ukrainian thing but then they don't give you numbers so here's number one just illustrated by an orange square at the start of the sentence. The initial milestone in Ukrainian statehood formation is attributed to the era of Kiev and Rus, a powerful medieval European state centered in Kiev. Kiev and Rus serves as a precursor to the eventual development of Ukrainian statehood. Spanning from the 9th to the early 13th century, the period of Rus existence is regarded as a proto-Ukrainian phase of Formation. Mihailo Khrushchevsky, Lexicon's favorite buddy, emphasized in his written works that Kiev and Rus, with its territorial ties to modern day Ukraine, was a direct predecessor of predecessor of the Ukrainian state. The name Ukraine first appears in writings in 1887 in the 1887 Kievan Chronicle. Number two, in the early 13th century, internal conflicts and the Mongol invasion led to the decline of Kiev and Rus as a unified political entity giving rise to separate rival principalities. The kingdom of Galicia Volhynia grew into a powerful center where the tradition of Ukrainian statehood thrived, despite, despite losing its independence in the 14th century. These territories fell under the control of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and the kingdom of Poland before coming, becoming part of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in 1569. This period marked the beginning of the initial interim phase in Ukrainian state formation, which could be defined by foreign dominance or a stateless interval. Despite external rule, Ukrainian nobility from families like Ostrovsky and Vishnevetsky, who were both mentioned in our chapter three here, Robin, played an important role in governing these lands, establishing a distinct Ukrainian social elite. The historical reality calls into question the Russian propaganda narrative that Ukrainian statehood ended with the decline of the kingdom of Halicia Volhynia. Halicina Volhynia, sh shifting the political focus to Moscow. <coughs> Pardon me. Number three, the Ukrainian Kazakh state, which flourished from the mid 17th century to the late 18th century, was the next step forward, step toward Ukrainian statehood. Oppressive policies conducted by Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth authorities led to popular uprisings in Ukrainian populated territories. The pinnacle of the National Liberation War, led by Bohdan Khmelnytsky, I've never heard it called that before, which started in 1648 and resulted in the establishment of an autonomous Kazakh state. The Kazakh state for features of democracy, including an elected head known as Hetman and the General Assembly or Kazakh Council, which served as the key decision-making body. 
Kazakh state possess its own laws, territory, and military forces. So I thought this would be a pretty good primer for our chapter here. Um, yeah, I think we can set the whole chapter now. <laughs> oh, it's just, but it's the primer. It's the primer. Um, the uprisings uh, number four, I think, because they don't give me numbers. The uprising spearheaded by Bohdan Khmelnytsky can be likened to the revolutionary. Where, oh, yeah, this is really what we're talking about. Oh, geez. Uh, that surged through Europe during the 17th and 18th century as it's a different perspective, though, from what it's actually. So, I mean, rep so, repetition so, is, is your friend. Don't worry about it. Yeah. As even though guided by the Cossacks, it was fueled by the Ukrainian populace themselves. While the Cossacks formed the core, the liberation struggle gave rise to the ideology of Ukrainian statehood, which garnered widespread support among the masses, which we will discuss. <laughs> further later number five or whatever in 1654 the Kazakh state was incorporated into Muscovy yet it managed to uphold its autonomy within its borders for some time however Russians intolerant Rush, the Russia's intolerance towards Ukrainian autonomy led to a gradual erosion of rights and freedoms in 1764 the institution of hetmanship was abolished in 1783, the administrative structure of the Kazakh state was ultimately dismantled and serfdom was introduced. Um, so I'm just going to skip a little there because it's basically all we're talking about. So here we are at number six. The Ukrainian National Revolution of 1917 to 1921 marked the next milestone in the formation of Ukrainian statehood. The dissolution of Austria-Hungary and the revolution in the Russian Empire played pivotal roles in accelerating the realization of the Ukrainian national idea. Amidst this period, Ukrainians established various forms of statehood, navigating instability and evolving circumstances in their pursuit of self-governance. On November 20th, 1917, the Ukrainian People's Republic was declared. On November 1918, the Western Ukrainian People's Republic was founded. Following that, both republics proclaimed their independence, and on January 22nd, 1919, these entities merged to form a single Ukrainian state. Despite their effort, both republics faced formidable adversaries, with the Ukrainian People's Republic falling to the Bolsheviks and the territories of the Western Ukrainian People's Republic being divided between Poland, Romania, and Czechoslovakia. The government of the Ukrainian People's Republic remained in exile. This era signaled the beginning of the final interim phase. After World War II, Ukraine as we know it was under Soviet control, yet it functioned as a homogeneous republic, a homogeneous republic. Despite the Holodomor and repression, Ukrainians persisted in their pursuit of statehood. The national movement was active from the 1960s until the collapse of the USSR. <clears throat> This is number seven. That's the final one. I have to check. Um, August 24th, 1991 stands as the conclusive milestone in the evolution of Ukrainian statehood. As Ukraine reclaimed its independence through the proclamation of the Act of Independence, this event was preceded by July 16th, 1990 Declaration of State Sovereignty. Following the Declaration of Independence, a referendum was held on December 1st, 1991, with an overwhelming 90.32% of Ukrainian citizens supporting independence. It is crucial to recognize that present-day Ukraine is not only a successor of the, of the Soviet Republic, but also directly inherits the legacy of the Ukrainian People's Republic. It's also important to mention that um, there was a majority uh, in every single oblast, including Crimea, which they just don't mention here. On August 22nd, 1993, Mykola Pavlyuk, the president of the Ukrainian People's Republic, in exile transferred the charter of the state of state center of the Ukrainian People's Republic to Leonid Kravchuk, the president of the independent Ukraine. 1993, it took a while for him to abdicate after there was a real Ukraine. That's a story I'd be interested in hearing. <clears throat> Since 2014, an independent and sovereign Ukraine has entered a phase of defending its statehood against Russia's centuries-long aggressive intent to undermine it. 
With the Russia's full-scale invasion of 2022, this defensive policy has taken on existential dimensions. Each significant milestone in the history of Ukrainian statehood did not occur in isolation. The deep-rooted traditions of Ukrainian statehood, as well as the foundational ideas that surfaced during its inception, have continued to resonate in subsequent historical area, eras through varied political frameworks. These stages collectively underscore the enduring continuity of the state-building journey, journey in Ukraine, highlighting the evolution and enrichment of political ideologies inspired by previous periods. Whew. Anastasia Heresemchuk, Deputy Editor-in-Chief at Ukraine World, and definitely an academic. That last paragraph broke my face, Robin. It's time for book club, though. <laughs> I know what you mean, but very actually, that was a very good, uh, very good uh, short introduction to what we'll be talking about tonight. I just wanted to mention two things that came up in what you were reading. One was, uh, you know, I remember when I was first looking at this, especially when we were reading the Zelensky effect. Um, you know, Ukraine has a mature civil society, um, which is would is it's vanishingly unlikely that such a thing could happen in 30 some odd years after independence. Um, and, you know, that was, that was when I first started thinking about that, I started looking back in history because obviously as, as this article was saying, uh, the, the Ukraine has been, has been working on developing its, you know, it's, they've been putting everything in place for the independent state for a long, long time, which is why they were able to, uh, you know, hit the ground running, so to speak. The Russians didn't object to uh, to Ukraine breaking away to start with because they had. I mean, they they've gotten it wrong from the get go. They they figured that that Ukraine would the Ukrainian independent Ukrainian state would collapse in a couple of years and then they could go and take it back again. Uh, obviously, uh, obviously, a history uh, education in in Russia leaves a lot to be desired. Um, Lexicon, did you did you have something to add at this point? Yeah, Adam, go ahead. Oh man, I was trying to wave at Lexicon and it turned and when I hit the hand, which made it extra like I was trying to get your attention. But I'm sure she might be having problems I, with that sticky mic. No, I, I yeah, the, I, I figured uh, that was it. Out anyway. Yeah, I figured that was I I I know that with 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 Lexicon, I got I have, so, I have we need to get somebody to sprinkle some uh, sprinkle some holy water on that phone or something. <laughs> Uh, anyway, keep on trying to get unmuted. I've got something I want to talk about for a second, Lexicon, and then maybe maybe you'll be unmuted by then. I think we're going to leave once Lexicon gets that mute off. I think we're going to leave her unmuted as long as we can because this is uh, frustrating for everybody involved because you always have interesting things to say once you could finally uh, we could finally hear you. I just wanted to mention uh, Adam mentioned before a website called Ukrainer, um, which is it's a fabulous fabulous site and particularly because. I mean, there is stuff about the war, but I look at it as as a place to go and learn about why Ukraine is so important to save. What it is about Ukraine that that gets people so attached to it? What is it? What what is special about Ukraine? Um, I've been going through. There's a whole series of um, of uh, articles about different minority groups in Ukraine. And that's even the wrong word to use because one of the things you learn very quickly in reading these things is how well integrated. Uh, Ukrainians from different backgrounds are into the main fabric of Ukraine. They don't really exist as ethnic minorities, even though they are. Um, I've been actually reading these in Ukrainian with uh, with my uh, conversation buddy. Um, and they're, it's they're, it, it's hard going. I have to look up a lot, but it's they're real. They're well written. They're, they're very enjoyable and very interesting. Even my friend who is Ukrainian has learned a lot about. Uh, about Ukraine that he didn't know before, so it's they're well written. Um, I read one one recently about Koreans in Ukraine, which was fascinating. There is a there's a significant group of Uk of Koreans who uh, came from Sakhalin Island. I think they ended up there. It had to do with the Second World War and the uh, and uh, North Korea, and they ended up in in Sakhalin Island, and then. Uh, migrated into Ukraine during the Soviet Union. Um, anyway, it's I. I could go on there, but there are all sorts of different Nigerians, Cubans, um, 
there's a there's a German speaking areas in the Carpathians. Um, that have been there for hundreds of years. There's a Swedish speaking town that Yeni Utai talked about. Uh, Poles, Bulgarians, uh, you know, Crimean Tatars, Karaites. Karaites are are a group of um, of um, related to to Jews, but who never never accepted a rabbinic Judaism. They come from before them, so it's they've split off from uh, from uh, the regular the regular you know the mainline Jews at this point. Oh, and a bunch of other ones. It's it's fascinating. So Ukrainer uh, is it dot org Adam? I don't remember. They're really really wonderful, and they have a lot of of, of videos and whatever. It's just if you want to find out. Everything you want to know about about Ukrainian culture, well, not everything, but a lot, is a wonderful website. And I see Lexicon's mute is off. Hi, Lexicon. Hi there. Ukrainer.net. I, I had just wanted to ask what Adam was reading from because I, I wasn't up when he first started. But it's a uh, very, very good uh, summary of, as you say, what we're about to talk about. What was that? It was uh, ukraineworld.org, and they've got this series in their analysis tab. Um, that's like seven things to know about Ukraine's dot, dot, dot. And the most recent one was, which is right on their main page right now, I think, or close to it, at ukraineworld.org, uh, is seven things to know about Ukrainians, Ukraine's statehood formation journey. Some of the other ones are seven things or eight things to know about the ukrainian national movement 10 things to know about ukrainian language and so on so there's this doing this little series and it's pretty awesome go ahead lexicon well it was making me think both what you were reading and what um robin was saying too that you see Khmelnytsky's um like the cossack rebellion and then you have i mean he only survives about 20 years but the hetman it survives for you know a hundred years kind of off and on and there's the ruin and all that of course uh catherine the atrocious gets rid of it as, as soon as like about five minutes after she has finished killing her husband and coming to the power but um and she immediately institutes serfdom and bans uh, anything ukrainian and so on and so on so and then you could sort of think that okay for 200 more years there's no more ukraine and somehow it just kind of appears as you were saying robin it's like civil society showing up in a space of 30 years but of course and what we're going to see here but i'm again thinking about reading about um that historian uh, Khrushchevsky's life, he is, um, what you see anyway, is that the part of Ukraine that's under the SARS for all of those years is being like roundly smashed apart as much as possible while the SARS make use of the intelligentsia of Ukraine in the service of the administration. But the Western part, the Halichina, Halich that survives, or Galicia as they call it, um, uh, in the West is uh, there's an actual active um, traffic between the Tsarist part of Ukraine and uh, Halichina, and there's actually four oblasts or regions that are um, that are under variously the Polish Lithuanians and then the Austro-Hungarians. Anyway, active um, traffic of um, manuscripts that are being printed in the west and then smuggled back into the east because they weren't just printing them just to you know have their writings appear in print so you've got ukraine surviving you've got the and the western influence of the reformation renaissance those kinds of things of uh, what what you're going to see in uh, in Ritzak, in our chapter but uh, say in Hrushevsky's period, he is actively fighting. He's in Kiev, which is uh, at the limits. It's under the Tsarist Empire. And he's struggling all the time to, uh, at, he's back and forth. He's teaching in Lviv in the West, but he's going into, he, he has come from, he's been living in Kiev. And uh, he's trying to uh, wrangle um, right to publish something in the Ukrainian language, like there'll be a conference of Slavic scholars, and it'll be okay for a paper to come from in the Czech language, 
from off there in Moravia or somewhere, but it's not all right to have a paper in this conference published in Ukrainian. And so I just saw reading um, about his life. It, to me, it's an image of how that struggle for Ukraine went on. Yeah, in the 200 years since the Cossack Rebellion, and of course the Cossacks survived the, for hundreds of years. And later on again, when um, Ukraine is administered as a, as a Soviet Socialist Republic um, for 70 years, how, what are we looking at here? Yeah, well, starting from 22 and going right up till, uh, uh, yeah, almost 70 years. So it's administered and there is a, and there's various, we're going to see, um, rebellions, what would we say, uh, efforts, attempts of flourishing, of writing in Ukrainian. There's the off again, on again, Soviet policies towards Ukraine. But that civil society, I think, is as I think you're right, Robin, that it doesn't doesn't just suddenly merge from ninety one on from nineteen ninety one onward, but has been um, bubbling along on the back burner and percolating. Percolating, yes, it's mijate. <laughs> Stewing doesn't sound positive in English, but yes, percolating for all of those decades. Um, and and so that I sort of see that Soviet period, it's kind of two-edged because, yeah, they continue the genocidal policies. And at the same time, Ukraine is an entity and they clearly realize it is. And Ukrainians clearly, I mean, maintain some some with greater success than others. But that's just what you guys are making me think about. Anyway, it's a really interesting reference. Thanks a lot. Lexicon, did you... You're the part of the article where I referred to Hershevsky as your boyfriend. Oh no, I must have. That must have been what rang the bell in my ear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, I'm, I'm totally smitten. Well, that it called you off anyway, so that worked out. Well, should we get into this book, Robin? Did you get yes. my um? my second chapter three note yes sent yes. Back at you? yes i did i i'm gonna i'm working from that from the the one that you just sent me uh, so we've got three different versions going here but uh i think this will work um uh just just to remind everyone we are reading ukraine the forging of a nation by yaroslav kretsak professor of ukrainian history at uh, ukrainian catholic university in lviv um and we are in the chapter called Interlude, A Brief History of Ukrainian Bread. Um, and uh, we're, we're just, we are just finishing the chapter. Um, we were talking about, about that bad, those, that bad uh, section of time. Uh, Lexicon, why don't you take your hand out unless you are, want to contribute again, because then I won't know whether you uh, want to jump in or not. No, 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 I didn't mean to mute. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're allowed. You're allowed to not be muted. It's just I won't know if you want to if you want to say something. If your hand is up the whole time, that's all I meant. Oh well. Anyway, okay. Um, uh, we're talking about that period of time where where um, where uh, uh, things were you know were not doing so well for Jews in Ukraine, um, but. Uh, it's, I'm going to back up just a little bit because I'm not sure. I think my sound cut out at the end of the book club last week, and I'm not sure how, how far I had gotten before I was talking to myself. Um, they're talking about, he mentions that, you know, the ir irony that when the Jews m m came into Ukraine um, was in a period of time when serf serfdom was, was being promoted. And so um, Jews, unfortunately, uh, were as... They were not allowed to own land, so they took up uh, positions that often ended up being um, uh, representatives of distant Polish landlords. And unfortunately, because they were the face of the insurfers, uh, the peasants who were insurfed obviously resented them, and it would focus on the people who were actually there. So that was part of it, and as as he says, the animosity was amplified by religious factors. We you know we all know about those, um, um, but and as we mentioned also, the the early modern modern periods, the pogroms 
were um, were not just perpetrated by Ukrainians. They they were they were perpetrated by others. But in Jewish memory, historical memory. Um, I think aided by Russian disinformation uh, or lack of responsibility, taking of responsibility. Unfortunately, a lot in the Jewish community, there is a there is a um, there is a tendency to think of Ukrainians as having been the perpetrators of all the pogroms in a you know deeply anti-Semitic nation, which was never the case. I mean, as I said, you find an anti-Semite anywhere. You know, there are anti-Semites all over the place. There are anti-Semites in places where there would never have been Jews. That's really quite remarkable. But Ukraine is not the place. If you want to find anti-Semites these days, Ukraine is not a good hunting ground. Um, I mostly like to find them at the end of my boots. <laughs> yes, that works. Um, yeah, anyway, okay. Um, in fact, I'm going to skip a little just to point out here. Um, one of the largest groups of the righteous among the nations, which are the people uh, that the uh, National Holocaust Museum in Israel, Yad Vashem, has um, recognized by name as people who, who saved Jews during the Holocaust, one of the largest groups of any any group in, in that museum are Ukrainians. So that's, you know, that's, and that's an important thing to remember in all of this. Anyway, so we're talking about um, the the end of the uh, the end of tr of a traditional Jewish society with modernity. Um, a lot of good things happen, but um, it 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 um, and well, I guess that could you know it depends on on how you feel about traditional Jewish society. I suppose good and bad that it, that it changed. Um, the interesting thing, and this I'd never thought about, but it's true. He says there that when as as because Jews were not um, a ruling elite, they 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 uh, they tended to identify with the ruling elites, Poles, Russians, Americans, and to quote him, he says there were so many Jews in Ukraine, but no Ukrainian Jews. And this is something I have noticed again and again. I found out that one of my favorite pianists, Vladimir Horowitz, I always thought was a Russian Jew, and he he grew up he he was born outside of Kiev and grew up and trained in Kiev, so he obviously was really a Ukrainian Jew, but as he's saying, there are lots of Jews in Ukraine, but not many Ukrainian Jews. This is interesting. So, I mean, it's a sidelight, but it was an interesting one. Um, oh, and this is one of, I, I love Fritzak. He's got such a good sense of humor. I mean, it comes, it, it sneaks into things here. He, um, as far as Jews go, he said, you know, in terms of assimilating, there was no u ruling or middle class to assimilate to because you had a choice of being pe a peasant or a priest. And to quote him here, and this choice, to put it mildly, hardly corresponded to their life ambitions. <laughs> I, just it, I just loved it. <laughs> anyway, so, yes. Uh, yeah, that was so, so good. Yeah. Just the understatement. Right, exactly. Yeah, there's a, he's, he has a little bit of the British about him, although he's not British, but yes, in terms of understatement. And also, as Lexicon pointed out, if I ever, if I manage to trap him this summer, if he's on campus when I'm there, one of the things I really want to pursue with him was how Jesuitical his education was, because he does seem like quite a Jesuit, although I don't see any evidence of that in his, uh, in his bio. Anyway. Um, okay, so um, so going back to the relationships of Jews and Ukrainians, the relationships are often better than in that bad period. Study A study of language and culture show numerous borrowings back and forth. I am actually keeping a list of my own of, of cognate words in, in Ukrainian and Yiddish, and it's getting bigger. I don't have a lot already, but it, it, every once in a while I, I'll stumble across something that, uh, you know, points this out to me. And it's not borrowings only in one direction. They seem to go in both. Um, and in terms of, of uh, rights, rights, uh, civil rights for Jews, Ukrainian politicians were the first in the Austro-Hungarian Empire to demand recognition of Jews as a separate nation with all its associated rights. The Ukrainian People's Republic of 1917 had inclusive legislation. I mentioned the righteous among the nations. Um, and this I found really interesting too. So, Economic conflicts was, was were the economic conflict was one of the main causes of the animosity between Jews and Ukrainians, and his example of that was the fact that um, as soon as the Ukrainian peasant uh, land connection was broken, you know, as soon as as the peasants were no longer serfs and Jews are no longer representing the landlords.
example of it, it shows shows that this was uh, only recently too. You guys probably knew it already. One of the largest. and made common cause with each other because they found that they had much more in common than they had divided them. And I'm going to let, uh, I think you, 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 you like this, Adam. So I'm going to let you talk about Euromaidan and uh, the Ukrainian Jews there. Which is a name that he says is a, a double slur, both in the Ukrainian language, if we're being honest, um, um, and Bada, which refers to um, the Ukrainian Uh, who spent time in a Nazi jail and died because Nazi. When I'm Ukrainian, I don't really hold Vandetta too close in my heart because, you know, there's lots of history and, and uh, heroes to look back on. So I, when I'm, whenever I'm bonking and people start throwing Vandetta at me, I'm like, like the dead, the the bald guy that was the I kind of throw it off. I I but if anyone's throwing them at me as a Nazi or whatever. You know, focus on what the Moscow propaganda wants us to focus on. But in classic Ukrainian civil disobedience style, this group of Ukrainian Jews at Maidan called themselves the Zhedo Banderov. We loved it, and it's um, you know this is the the, the one of the, you one one of the many things Ukrainians are one of the, Banderite Nazis, and so so a bunch of. You know, not only was it funny, but you know it had to drive the Russians it was crazy, which makes it even twice as funny. Crazy. Means what the word means, and uh, for them. You know, the, they can just call them uh, Glavrov when he was even asked that question. If you remember that uh, little controversy at the beginning of the war where he kind of uh, uh, like that is number one. Not Nazi characteristic for us is is um, genocide against Jews. The Soviet and definitely the Russian perspective. 
that is fact minus one. It's fact zero. It's not even part of what they're for them. The definition of Nazi. Because of their misinformation, I think part of oh, it all leads back to the Russians, Robin. I'm doing it again. Yeah, Russia, Russia, Russia. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, but it's 100% true what you're saying. What you're saying. And really, I think that, you know, part of the reason they use this word is it's, it's also, um, it's an emotional thing inside of Russia. Because, you know, I mean, they, they, they Russia did suffer pretty, you know, they, they really, I mean, they, they lost a lot of people, uh, you know, during, during, uh, during the, the uh, German invasion or whatever. And it's a way to shut down, uh, you know, to shut down rational thought. But yeah, the definition of, I mean, Ukrainians are Nazis only in the sense that they're not willing to allow the Russians to walk all over them and to tell them that they're not really Ukrainian. You know, so uh, I guess we're all Nazis when you come right down to it. And as you're saying, it may, the word has become meaningless because of that. Um, but it's it's an important thing. This is another thing that I think those of us who are in this this information bubble here, where we understand what's going on, it does need re revisiting with people sometimes because they hear about these all these Nazis in Ukraine, and. It, it's very important to point out to them that, yeah, I mean, first of all, the main number of Nazis in Ukraine will disappear if the Russians withdraw back across the border. Yeah, they're, uh, they're mention again because it's good to mention again Ukraine is is according to the Pew uh, Pew poll and Pew getting to the end of the uh, discursus on Ukrainian bread and getting to chapter three. Um, he, the last thing Herzog points out in this in this chapter is that um, the that uh, at, in po post modern and late modern eras uh, we have We saw in the early days of the war when Odessa and the Black Sea was being uh, being blockaded, that uh, Ukrainian crops are critical to avoid food. in and around Ukraine. This was true during two world wars and it is true today. I think that's, that is self-evident. And with that, we have are finally getting to chapter three, Cossack Ukraine, page 87 for those of you following along at home. Um, I'm gonna turn back over to Adam and Lexicon if you have anything you want to mention before we start on this chapter. Well, I'll talk for a bit in lexicon. Once you get unmuted, you can just uh, pipe up. I really liked the of the of the bread interlude, but I, the first couple sentences of this. Now I'm gonna straight up read it out of the book because straight up.
for God was a thousand years for the people on earth. is a, a consequential date as to ex as of the recent uh fall to be the same year that was the last year in the in the orthodox calendar year 7000 and they decided to count no more it's just so i just found that such a such a really uh just this a neat coincidence and uh, he sort of wraps the entire chapter here around that that uh that uh, concept robin but we've got a hand yeah let's, let's go to james hey uh, i just wanted to say get your walk I'm 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 working on it. I uh, had it out a little bit after I hung up earlier, and uh, now I want to say, keep keep in in bed, bit. I'm not saying it right. I'm not saying honey right, but uh, the keep, uh the bread. Yes, uh, these are words that have been introduced from Bob. e med. What's that again? Sorry, James. Chlib e mid. For thank you, Isabel. Duolingo is a blast, by the way. I did the I did the whole thing. Um, I, I'm I'm now I'm now harassing them for until uh, they start stalking you. Oh yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very funny. Yeah, I've I've told. Uh, okay, I'm gonna tell that story again. Then I I did. Lose my streak. Um, but after I finished it, and Duolingo, you should know, was developed by Ukrainians, like everything else good in the world, right? <laughs> but uh, so I, somebody had do this anyway. Um, of the same kind of drill stuff, uh, just in the opposite direction. So I did that. I did a little bit of it. Didn't get that much. I, you know, I have other things that I'm, I'm on to now. But so I stopped paying attention. Well, I started getting uh, emails in Ukraine. I did, I did it just, um, you know, you Learning to national duty for the Ukrainians. Like yes, it was very funny. <laughs>
different different grammatical structures that I'm now learning. In the presentation of the words from which you spoken or shown above in Ukrainian, capital letter in the first place, thus giving away a major cue. And I find that a to um, me a test uh, yes I did notice that too uh The part about um, the uh, choice of words and what to focus on are good. It's all about Yeah, well, no, okay. Uh, so are you gonna travel to Ukraine? Yes, then, okay, we could start at a different place and uh, work our way back around to uh, the family words at a later point, but getting into it with something that you're really motivated uh, to get a grasp of, of like, uh, where's the next good uh, pizza joint? You know, something like that. Uh, those. Absolutely, and I don't think it's bad to want to be a tourist. on yourself um and and uh, and building drones in the office every day because Yet it means if I don't get have coffee, I'm a very day. Genitive, so you you know that's that that's one of the. I, on that stuff before I started learning about, about the cases and everything, because to me, the case yeah, 
exactly. Exactly. And one last one last comment. Then we, I promise, we'll get back to the book. Um, one of the things that, that I found, you know, for for one thing, Ukrainian grammar is very complex, and there is no way in hell you're going to ever be able to speak the language if you're if you're having to. An hour to put a sense together. It's free to Ukrainian Ukrainians or people learning Ukrainian. It's normally a couple hundred dollars a year, I think. Canadian, by the way, Adam. Um, but I, I, I do. I do a lot of reading and reading of, of regular, you know, regular texts, uh, which, you know, Anyway, but with that, we are up to chapter three, Cossack Ukraine, page 87. Um, oh, and yes, and you were- The language, uh, or sorry, one more comment. The people of freedom, the language of rule. That's all I will say. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Actually, that's, that's the t-shirt I want. I tried to get somebody to design it, but it was too complex. It's Uh, a pivotal um, get what he meant. The year of the Reconquista, the year that the Arabs were expelled from Spain. Arab. He calls his book is based, I think the title is based in. So we are at page 89 now. The formed in 1569. Uh, uh, it was a unique place uh, in, in history at that time because it was really the only place that Catholics and Orthodox coexisted. in approximate equal numbers and we'll see why that was is is excellent that I've finished the Ukrainian uh, part of that so I'm, I'm reduced to like uh, just the the recap every day. Just who knows? <laughs> um, I don't think I, I can speak uh, much in Ukrainian, um, but I'm you know, at least learning. Probably could read some of it now. So. Thank you.
Look, do we have it up in the nest? We don't, uh, or do we? Um, I did, but oh, no, it's not. It's not showing up as a as a as the thing. I think uh, I retweeted the space wrong. So I'll I'll get the I'll work on oh, that. Oh, okay, I'll thanks. The actual placard in the nest here. Okay, any placard. Indian and ridiculous in English. H R Y. Because it it, re it reads so well in translation, it just must be fantastic in Ukrainian. I'm going to pick up a copy this summer, although I don't guarantee I'll actually be able to read it by then. But uh, I'm going to pick up multiple copies by then. Sort of combining how to. This 1492 was a big deal in America. If anybody knows anything about Puerto Rican history, which I now do, that like sparks fly out of her eyes. But we got to talk about her history in regards to what Ukraine is going through. Well, she's a Native American from the United States at one point as a Christian country followed Israel because because our because of our ties between Christianity and Judaism. And so I started wondering about the prime minister, you gotta help me with his name that begins with an N that I'm never gonna be able to say of Israel. Oh, Netanyahu. All right. So I went I decided in the back of my head that if this guy's ties are to the original 12 tribes of Israel than to the original. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, a lot happened before you moved. Wendy, I must tell you, dear, unless you're pushing 80, you're not a lot older than me. <laughs> You're a lot, maybe a lot older than Adam, but, but. I'm almost there. I was just saying, you know, I'm pushing 70 already, and, and that's one of the reasons I'm determined to go to Ukraine this summer, because I don't know how many, I'm in good health, thank God, I, you know, I'm fine, but, you know, when you get to be my age, you can't count on 30 or 40 more years to, to do things, and I don't want to get to a point where I have not been to Ukraine, and I can't anymore, because that would just break my heart.
and we have to to get to the book. But let's go to Brian first, and then we have to both promise we're going to actually try to plow through some of the this material. Over to you, Brian. This Very sad that we don't have more people that are standing up for freedom, standing up for justice, standing up for what is right, standing up against Vladimir Putinsky, that piece of shit Putinsky. So, folks, don't lose the hope. You know, keep uh, keep fighting, but also realize we are not doing enough. 200 people on the space when, um, you know, you're dealing with um, an existential crisis is not enough. Uh, chiming in the last two years or so. Doesn't make me special. Doesn't make me different. In in, in Russia and um, also really getting tired of you know the fact that people can't uh, you know demonstrate in Russia. Yeah, you're gonna, gonna pay a price. <laughs> the price is gonna be. Much too young to remember this, I'm sure, but I remember um, at the Democrat convention one, uh, you know, one of the years they were they were uh, nominate, nominating, and it was he, the the end of the speech. He's just a very, he, was, he was a Southern Baptist preacher type, really, really powerful. And he said just three, three times. Keep a fire on. This is really a problem, Adam. When when we started working together, I had no idea how much fun we'd have talking to each other. This is really really causes issues. <laughs> anyway, um, okay. We are um, okay. Uh, True. Uh, Poland was actually a much stronger influence on the develop of uh, development of Ukraine than Russia was, at least till the end of the 18th century. Um, there was a Polish presence from the annexation of Galicia, uh, uh, from 1349. Uh, central Ukraine was was part of uh, was under Polish uh, domination till World War One. Western Ukraine until World War Two, and that Polish influence. Um, had um well it had, had a, a number of important uh, uh important results uh what it ukrainian language was, was not
and identity, you know, following on till today, are also areas that had the greatest Polish, inf Polish influence. And also the transformation of Orthodox Rus of the of the Orthodox part, uh, the Ukrainian part of Orthodoxy into the Ukrainian nation, was a con consequence of the spread of Western Christian ideas to the East via Poland. And this lexicon, as pointed out, he uh, he definitely is a Ukrainian Greek Catholic uh, person. Um, I'm not. Any place else, I so the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, among other things, that united Ukrainian ethnic territory within the borders of a single state. And this was back in uh, in um, The borders to today. Um, the uh, oh, the, the um, this laid the foundation for Ukraine as a distinct as a distinct national community. Um, the Polish The, even the polls point to it as uh, I think is continues today in Ukraine. As a much more multi multi ethnic, religiously diverse, multi as a much commonwealth was both uh, a monarchy and a republic. Um, the petty gentry were were the main source of power. The Polish king governed, but not, that did not rule. the uh, The Polish gentry actually had the right to be tried only in in courts of other Polish gentry. The the, the Polish king couldn't push them around uh, to. The, before I do that. Oh, so, uh, <laughs> the actual. In 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 uh in Syria in serious history, so I can imagine what he's like in person when he's just you know being himself. <laughs> anyway, uh, being no, um, it, there's no. Place where, um, place where, um,
we can talk about the Buddhist past. Nobody in the Kremlin has the balls to put Putin into the graveyard. And it's really amazing to see. Here we are, 2024. We are watching uh, the Wagner Group. The Wagner Group tried to do it, but uh, Putin put him on an airline that didn't land. And, uh, you know, so... Um, it's really incredible. We're watching Putin, who's basically Adolf Hitler part two. Okay. Anyone who wants to argue me over, um, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But. I yeah, mean, thanks. He, of, of, of working on on our book club uh, selection right now, you're making very <laughs> important points. But I, I, I would like we're all, we're we're at ten o'clock. We're off, and we can get back to other issues. We've talked about this. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get to the core points here, but Thank you. yes, exactly. Thank you, Adam. Of the borderland since the Lithuanian Commonwealth to a bagel, a big hole in the middle with That's beautiful. I love that. <laughs> and the which is interesting. In the middle of the precedented privilege, they could choose the king. They could be judged only by a court of their peers. And they had the right, each individual, they had the right about democracy for only 10% of the population. Unusual. Um, um, Was that not part of the name of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth? And it was probably because uh, the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth was a the Ukrainian of that time period, and and to preserve the judicial system, which had uh, which had its its statutes written in Ukrainian or in Russian as they call it. Um, over time, 
um, being in union with in a country that was Um, early in the 70s, The Cossacks, the, the Orthodox, the Orthodox. That's that's how Belarus came about. It was that was the. So in the 17th century, yeah, same yeah. here. I I wonder how much they. I don't know if we're, we've gotten past that part, the, but the, no, it comes later, but the, whose realm, whose religion. Calculated, uh, you know, ideology or whether just, that's just how people were. I mean, I, I would not be, I would. Well, can you get back to me with an answer? <laughs> no, let's move on. Sure. I'll, I'll speak to Slav. This month in the summer. Um, yeah, anyway, okay, where was I? But seriously here, folks. Um, uh, okay, so after 1492, uh, Ritzak, uh, uh points out there were some radical changes in Europe, which had an impact on the Polish the Lithuanian Commonwealth also. There was something called the Price Revolution, which I have to admit I had never heard of before. It shows the, my, the dearth of my education. This was a period of high inflation from the late 15th through the mid 17th centuries. And we'll get into why that happened in a moment. And it's accelerated, uh, there was an accelerated collapse of Catherine the mediocre uh, took over Ukraine. Okay. Um, this is a quote. We can say the price revolution created the cost sucks and confessionalism made them Ukrainians. Sucks figure it out after we went through, I went through the next section. So keep this, keep this in mind, the Christ revolution, the end of the next section, understand what he means by that. 
anything here, Adam? Looks so okay. Does, does he mean confessionalism in terms of of Catholics and, and the way that we all like to go into a little box and 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 confess our sins and, and get told to go home and, and with ourselves and say things in another closet? Oh, oh is that oh is that how the Greek Catholics do it? Wow, well, <laughs> oh. <laughs> little Orthodox no, no, left no. you guys. Catholic, you know how how that's a that's a that that sort of con the the idea of confession and absolving your sins here on earth. Uh, through through uh, through only phenomena. Yes, well, as a good as a good Ukrainian Greek Catholic boy, that's what you would think of first. First, and I hope you've been to confession recently. <laughs> No, I don't. Uh, decades. Oh boy. This is from Ukraine, and he talks about. it but anyway um and so let's see where were we uh confessionalism and I'm a Democrat. I'm agnostic. He, as a free world, I don't see another path to to uh, victory. I don't know. Slavia Ukraini and. and and uh, this is um, Ukraine is is not just uh, dealing with uh, you know uh, Putin, but we we are Vladimir Putin in twenty twenty four. Now, so we so yeah, and I would say goodbye again. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, like Adam. That. Yeah, I, th I think uh, also. <laughs> I know, and, and you know, I, what does they say? People who are ignorant of history are doomed to repeat. It. And uh, and to understand uh, the importance of Ukraine, and and I have I, you know, I've become very more and more uh, uh, um, connected to Ukraine in learning. The history. I think it's. I think it's an important thing. Uh, old country with lots of 
history and laws a lot. important it, it's it's ukraine is a whole lot more any day of the week you're welcome to come up here And, and you know, express your feel and and you know, express your feelings. Uh, uh, you know, in support of Ukraine, and and you know, in support of Ukraine, and and. Uh, oh, what was her name? Um, Wendy. Yeah, Wendy mentioned before uh, the the uh, the Columbus arriving in the New World, not intentionally, but still was catastrophic for the local population, just in terms of bringing European uh, diseases and whatever, and wiped out a, a large portion of uh, of uh, Native Americans in in the New World. Um, but uh, so for Europe. Europe, the the most direct impact. I had always thought that you know the big thing that was 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 all of the the, uh, the new kinds of of uh, of vegetables. What's now uh, Bolivia in 1545? Um, it, by 1600, the total weight of silver on the European market had increased eightfold, which resulted in 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 uh, you know massive inflation, loss of uh, of rapid loss of value for coinage, and sharp price increases for food. Grain prices increased the factor of eight to ten. This is what's called the price revolution. It was an opportunity for, you know, people who had, oh, oh, sorry, Adam, I'm not looking at the screen. Over to you. Oh, I would just really quickly wanted to say this, uh, just with the silver again, right? Um, and so, and, and it's strange how, and so, and, and it's strange how, how it's come up. I'll probably put it back in because the, um, Uh, to European markets, and so I just, just really quick. That came up again. Yeah, that's right. The mon. The price revolution also is opportunities for gentry and other of Europe, but it's un where the grain was grown was were not near any major river arteries that could go into the rest of Europe. And What's now Ukraine at this in this time period, as well as uh, the protection 
construction of the southern border was provided stability for economic development. Um, over to you, G-Man. Are other people having a lot of trouble understanding GMN? It's just. I would like to, I'd look like, I would like to hear what you're saying. Okay, what about now? Oh. Okay, what about now? In different parts of Europe, around the 16th century, 17th. Because so you have the increase of free European country. Um, so I'm wondering, is that you know, no, okay, I take the point about the bread basket of Europe not maybe being a. It's an interesting quote that you know the price. Yeah, go ahead, Adam. I think you're going to say it. He comes Good up job. here. He he tells us what. Makes a lot of sense if, they, if it, 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 there's even less, even less inclination to export the stuff. If, it's, if you're not going to make that much money off of it either, and um, seventeenth century, um, and increased demand. a few times of you know the the basically the wrong turns that that can be taken in the in the turns that that can be taken in the in the increasingly democratic uh, um, So happening in Muscovy, um, even though they
there was an extreme surf of Um, peasant. Please, slaves. <laughs> that's pretty, uh, that's pretty. Jack name for the southern parts of the borderland of the K of Voivoda ship, there's that word again, were under the direct authority of the king. The nobility could not demand the return of fugitives from the king's lands, and royal authorities and local magnates actually encouraged peasant resettlement there, which is very interesting because they knew with the that even though they were this sort of I think the you know the the we we see oh, I seem to remember finding that a reference to that term someplace else. I think it may not reference area in the southern part of the steppes. Uh, going to the Black Sea, which was not under, which there wasn't serfdom, that wasn't, it wasn't under the, uh, under the uh, thumb of the, there were uprisings in 1590s and 1620 and 1630. They were demanding the rights and privileges of as the same as the gentry. Um, they that's a self governance right rights to land, hunting, fishing. The the nobility. But what they had, what they had missed was at this point, you know, they, they were too established to be, uh, to be, uh, dissed. Anyway, back to you, Adam. Yeah, and I really like this, this, uh, the gentry complaint quote, all of Ukraine has gone Cossack in terms of their, uh, their uh, lack of seeing, you know, it, it's pretty funny. He doesn't really say it outright, but he's, you know, like goes into some 
linked to Yeah, cool hairdos, definitely. <laughs> um, anyway, okay, so so yeah, they, they that was that was a definitely a strategic mistake, uh, not not uh, understanding that the that the uh, the Cossacks, uh, well, they had every right to consider this as part of the gentry. They had they had uh, done what uh, needed to be done. Um, okay, in the now, okay, the next part of this is a fascinating part that you know he gets in again to some of the religious issues. I yeah, I I believe so. Oh, you I, know I, he's. Referring to because most histories in, in referring to because most histories in in Ukrainian uh, Greek Catholic, there's no question about it. Um, yeah, that makes it interesting. I, again, I want to go back to find out what, what, what uh, Sergei Plochi has to say about all this, if I ever manage to corner him. But anyway, uh, okay, the Reformation uh, split the Western Christian world into Catholics and Protestants. Um, and the result of many wars was the Peace of Augsburg in 1555. The reason this becomes important here is because of the principle, and I will not offend your ears by my Latin, which <laughs> I learned Latin when I was in Germany, so I have a really bizarre accent. But anyway, uh, uh, basically the principle is this, that the, the a subject of the ruler should have... Can I say it in the way... That the guy on Audible says. It oh, please do. Terrible. Please do. Eighteen hundreds, it doesn't get so bad. But when he says in seventeen seventeen, I, I can't. I can't. yeah, to that. <laughs> No, I told him, Julie, don't go. It's the eyes, buddy. Man, I told him, don't go. <laughs> Did you ever? <laughs> You know, or the priest, um, uh, 
and told him it's the 15th, like you don't go, you don't go around town. On oh, I'm a little bit short in the tooth for Wayne and Schuster, but that is one of the ones I remember. Sure, but watching 1987 comedies that I didn't understand yet in my uh, that I this means in English oh yes it means in other words the that if you're a subject of a ruler you got to have the same religion of the ruler that if you Uh, has the same uh, religion. In in Germany, this was up to the point that there in in Germany, this was up to the point that there even uh, there even towns that that Okay, now the piece of Westphalia. Um, oh, you made the same point I did. Okay. Uh, anyway, boarding the piece of Westphalia. Made That's why I was laughing because I, I was going. I was reading as I. Uh, oh, as oh I, very good. I was just going. I was like <laughs> listening to. Invi inviolable. Um, would you like to repeat your rent now, Adam? <laughs> your rent now, Adam? <laughs> uh, all caps. Can Suri and Canadian. <laughs> Basically, missed the memo on this. Back caps exclamation marks. <laughs> Great minds. What can I tell you, folks? The so as these two things, the piece of Augsburg and the piece of Westphalia, it's a formula for a state based on religion rather than as ethnicity, and the foundations for, as he calls it, the marriage of religion. Germany. Ethnic in the large sense of having been members of the same state. Now, uh, page 103 we're up to, how, how Cossacks became bandits he calls them like Robin Hood Sitch meaning what?
Hubby were talking about this last Wednesday. Wednesday. Okay, so st stronghold, you said, yeah. This was a, a I mean, Fremen, whatever. This was a, a hidden wooden fortress of, it was like this, the uh, the uh, central camp of the, of the Zep. Russian troops of Catherine the incredibly ordinary population when they were not at war. The difference is the 1550s. Uh, Ukrainian uh, society was they might be Muslim they might be who knows what Uh, I learned about all this stuff. Uh, Birdie. And uh, so this, this is part of our curriculum, some Ukrainian history. And I, I remember grade five or six. Um, He thought the Cossacks were cool. <laughs> Remember a couple of us building snow forts way in the north. little crazy Cossacks. There, uh, so um, but uh, so it, he always wanted Ukrainian, a Ukrainian Canadian childhood, folks. <laughs> it's it's great though. I love it. Um, okay. Though. Okay. Registered. Company. These uh, this militarized group. Uh.
sending army, sending army to protect, uh, to help protect uh, um, uh, the area from attack. Orders from him. Uh, this uh, this caused friction between registered Cossacks who friction between registered Cossacks who received salary and advantages, including sick pay, which as he says, a pan-European or Euro-Asian phenomenon rather than a, a, a local, uh, you know, local Rus phenomenon. This was a completely new fact to me. Yeah, I, I, I wonder, I, it may, I, I, you know, he is, he's the on such a deep dive into so many things. This may not have such a Okay, and okay. Oh, now we're getting to confessionalism. That was what come up before. Um, this was the other issue that he points as an important, at an important, important factor in uh, in uh, the development of the Ukrainian nation. Uh, of there was an influx of Protestants and Protestants ideas into the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth as a result of the religious into the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth as a result of the religious tolerance as the Jews had come in an earlier time period. This was where the Jesuits come in. They were an important factor. Um, they had some good and some less good uh, um, effects. They did. They worked to stop Protestantism um, with education, as Jesuits to this day are known for. You know, for their expertise in education. Uh, they found Rus infested with heretics, i.e., Jews and, sch and schismatics, i.e., the Orthodox which they were working against. That about this time, and this is between it and the activities of the Jesuits, it, it functionally ended the Polish-Lithuanian conflict. Theologically, Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. What it resulted in. Church. Um, since Catholic, geez, because that, that's my that's like where that's the. choir thing and I think
school because Lviv is like three quarters cool school. sermon, uh, the liturgy, and everything they full little Sunday afternoon in Lviv. The Greek Catholic priest and listen. Other church that's actually a school. <laughs> And in Ukraine under the sun. The conversation buddy, he was he was born in in the in the eighties and his parents had to sneak a a because priests in the it was the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church was an underground church. Uh, Catholic Church was an underground church uh, under the Soviets, and none of the priests married the Soviets. Where basically any Able to assert and is persecuted for if you know they were they were working against the against the Ukrainians. Stay. It amazes me that they that they were allowed to stay in Ukraine after Ukraine after twenty fourteen. Um, because they do highlight those specifics. Orthodox priests being um, targeted in the occupied territory. So once again, here's um, American politicians and other Westerners um, parroting these exact opposite of the truth. Occupied territory. Yeah, no, it is. It is absolutely infuriating, and it's there's there's no. Orthodox Church of Ukraine, Moscow, Patriarchate, or whichever.
whatever it is, and the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, whatever it is, and the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. They can get along with this. What what the uh, what some of the orthodox. new church um which i mean to this day it's not it's i don't think it's a majority at all in ukraine but boy have they have they done a lot with my i i owe whatever ukrainian i know to ukrainian to uh to uh ukraine catholic university so <laughs> there was resistance and there was a revival in Uh, uh, in you know, were, but there was conflicts happening on what they call left bank Ukraine, you know, because on what they call left bank Ukraine, you know, because it was all part, there was wars between, it was all part, there was wars between. was under the control of I, yeah exactly but since it was farther away from the continue a little bit uh, more open oh i printed book chose to didn't choose to go that route that's that's that level breaking ties with what they call the trade tourist units but as a result of this we we spoke uh yesterday i mean last week about the, the fact that in the Orthodox world, and this is this is limited to in Ukraine. This was not in Russia. Um, they developed their own schools. In fact, uh, in fact, uh, Adam. <laughs> points and sat in a second. They developed to go back and look at original text.
for me. I, when it's written in English, so there's a can't even begin to it. It's the Bible that the Ukrainian presidents take the oath of office. You know, one of, one of the only. Yeah. The emphasis on every syllable, but. Funny. Oh. Polish is, I would find. Polish ten times harder to read than 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 you. Polish program and write and Latin letters because it'd make them so much. It would be so much easier to integrate into the rest of Europe. I said, "Yeah, I've got two words for you. I got three words for you, or or two words, whatever. Try to read Polish. You know, three words. Right? Try to read. That's four words. Uh, you know." It, you know, in, in Ukrainian, there's a letter where it makes a sound. It... Jeez. 804, getting messages from Prince. Uh, wow. I'm just, I'm just going to, I would like, I think. Wow. The 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 uh, uh the terrible is great. Um so Muscovy, but it was burnt down and he books in the language that the people understood and therefore bringing people closer to their god but not in muscovy haha -ha. that's a good end of the book club i think yeah yeah absolutely and this is i'm having so much fun with this i mean this is Coin. I never how do how do we do, how do we decide who drops first? I really don't care. It's later for you. I really don't care. It's later for you. <laughs> just the way it's mostly in when he says the teen, the teen yeah. sound. I don't know. It just gets. It is me. funny. Yeah, it's it's it. He so it sounds so uh so he sounds so uh what's the word like constipated or something, which is the exact opposite of what Hrutsak is like. You know, I mean, obviously he could narrate. It. Yeah. 
correct himself because he's got a very thick Ukrainian accent. Right. I have trouble right. understanding him. But it's it's a shame when they get uh, a narrator who uh, a narrator who really doesn't fit the personality. Of everyone to retweet the space it's 8 8 p.m where i am which means that it is 5 8 a.m in cave 3 8 a.m in london seeing any of that other co-hosts popping up until this very second when my friend Prince co-host my my ship passing in Prince Heather my ship My own, so you, you, my own, you jammed some. My, improvisation. It is. Jazz you, style you want to hear about it? to go whoa What do you think? The Prince Heather Easy Borscht Recipe. Open a can of beets, dump it in a bowl, dollop of sour cream, there you go. Can of beets, dump it in a bowl, dollop of sour cream, there you go. Go. Dan. Okay, fine. Dave, how are you, Nafo? Dave, stick that O on the other end. I didn't realize that Scott was also in uh, a fellow Mountain Time Zone resident. I thought I was the only Scott, one. No, Scott is central. Oh, Adam. he said it was eight. Uh, I'm sorry, not Scott. That's Adam. Adam, yes. I'm sorry, not Scott. That's Adam. Adam, yes, yes. James has come up and put his hand. Well, I think there's some uh, wisdom in that you might.
lot of raw I eat a lot of raw cabbage and um, raw kale. Um, so yeah, I see. I make this really good vegetable barley salad, cold salad, vegetable barley cold salad. I make that every couple of weeks. I mean, I, I, about about twice a month, I make that. Let's put it that way. And uh, yeah, it's chock full of a ton of vegetables. Yeah. That there sounds go. pretty good. Did this this reflects, you know, a few minutes ago now. Now uh the alarms. And I just thought that would be an eye on things. And I thought I, I think next time. I'm up. I'm going to do this on the hour. My in touch with what's going on in Ukraine. Hour to hour. Becoming like the NATO cooking show. Did you say your cat was a Catholic? Um, yes. Well, why didn't you say there was chips with that? Yes, that makes. Well, why... oh, cover I up could, the uh, oh, I, cover I up the beets. beets. I could no. The beets taste really. Good. I draw the line at that. You guys are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Robin <laughs> is not, not crazy, though. Right. Robin is crazy because she, she no, she's not. A very, yeah, she is. She makes a very complicated. I must say, uh, my my kitchen still. still Still looks like an axe murder has been, <laughs> and it looks. But Prince, I'm absolutely horrified. It's no. uh, I I love I love I love can. But uh, still, uh. red and be very concerned. That you have in test. I think that's a good idea. Do you advise the doctor if you buy?
in the microwave. Let's face it. You can throw it in the microwave, push the buttons, 12 seconds later, and then push the So. I am all about efficient cooking, James. There is um, Bear Creek soup mixes. If you've ever had a Bear Creek soup, Creek soup mix, they make a really, really good wild, creamy wild rice one. Anyway, it takes all of, you know, however long it takes to put into my cooking. I make Stirring it for eight minutes, it just for corns, and that's it, uh, and a little lemon juice. Yeah, no, and you know, the only time I do get complicated with my cooking is when I make the barley in the Instant Pot and cut up the vegetables myself, the size that I like them, when I make my barley. Dressing, which isn't hard. Apple cider vegan. Good evening, Zero. How are you? Hello, <laughs> I'm good, thank you. And how are you? I'm fine. I'm expecting your Ukrainian, Scottish, uh, Australian sensibilities to be. and uh, you can, can you know you can freeze it actually uh, um, because that's how Ukrainians cook actually the, the times that I grew up in the in Ukraine Trainers, where everything was very trainers, where everything was very economical. So, you know, my my parents would cook massive, or my and my grandma would cook massive Um, or, you know, yeah, see, from, that uh, I would do. And you should. You should. And yeah. that would support, that would support, you know, the, the um, Lviv's front, front line kitchen. Yeah. So there's another thing. I would probably not follow the I like really quick soup to make too. I like making noodle soup, chicken noodle soup. But it was just like, no, I just want to open a can and eat. That was how hungry I was today.
severely offended. Um, it, it, um, it, it, it worked. It is a good meal. Um, James worked. A few bits of chocolate, um, some uh, uh, it's it's got to have lemon juice. cookie uh, so much faster than I can make all the individual cookies. So now I make all the individual cookies. So now I make cheat cookies and uh, try to split it up. green stuff in there too. Um, you could try kale or maybe, I don't know, another kind of product. Just No kale, no kale. Uh, James, but James knows exactly what I'm talking about, I think. Just <laughs> spinach, but, spinach is good on no, everything. No, 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 no. Frankly, uh, this to, is too much to, of a commitment. Used to, used to be popular in brownies, but anyway. You, sure. Magical it butter machines. Yeah, it does. Really oil. All right. Anyway, enough for the oil. All right. Anyway, enough for the. Dan. I'm sorry if I offended you when you asked me about your beet soup. Um, and you James. Oh, so, okay. And and James, can you send me that recipe? And does that have raisins in it? Uh, sometimes it does. It depends on who the audience is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can can you send it to me DM? I'd really It's got raisins in it. You like raisins. this <laughs> Miss.
in Ukraine just keeps you going. Before time, it's just never turned out right. Um, and I had good borscht a couple of times um, and it was really tasty and I think the key to it as far as I can tell is really preserving the intensity of the beet flavor um, and I think the problem that I was having was I was cooking the soup too long because uh, just didn't taste the same so I Prince Heather yeeted herself out um Robin do you have any tips to share yeah Rob At least half of the beets that you've gotten for your borscht to go to uh, to um, and then you take out. You take out and squeeze out as much as you can out of those shredded beets and discard them and keep that. Use that as the base stock for making your board. And it, it comes out with a really, really strong, uh, wonderfully vibrant color. my recipes uh how they were set up but do you add some beet back in kind of uh, oh for pasta? sure absolutely for sure i, I use yeah. about about maybe a, a half or a little more of the beets that i've got for the, the borscht and and then the other half i i also i tend to shred them i guess you can chop them whatever but i put that and then it calls for cook that actual pieces of beef in there too. Yeah. Yeah, that that makes sense. And uh, that that or better apples. So I heard somewhere you Thank you again. Yes, I just wanted to Amos and I want to say yes to everything that Robin has said. That's basically exactly how my my I'm going by my grandma's recipe because my, my mom cooked it a little bit different, but exactly how Like if you have any smoke, uh, smoke. I, 
Oh, I was going to ask too, do you put any is another really good one just a little bit of that and then listen to it that's really I, I uh, love smoked cheese, smoked Gouda. I think that takes some of the flavor away. So I scrub them really well and cut off the parts that are particularly dirty, you know, but the rest really well. anything for extreme lengths of time you basically the beets are done already you just have to cook the the Back to Slavo Kweni. Peter, I'm Slava, and I would absolutely use red. Is it absolutely is, and so I know I'm twisted. Yeah. Yes, I I like the green just because it gives. A uh, very jazzy way, um, but one of my my favorite things uh, to throw in I found is actually my favorite things uh, to throw in I found is actually um. Put in some of that, uh, try that. Not title I put up, if you look to the title, it kind of fits. just how damn good it was, was uh, on a business trip up to northern Minnesota, right on the Canadian border, right up, up by Winnipeg. So our Winnipeg friends all know that, yeah, there's a lot of Ukrainians up there too on the Minnesota side. Um, it literally was like about 10 miles from the, the uh, Manitoba border. Attention to the weather. So when I left Minneapolis, it was really
town up right in the northwest corner of Minnesota. Uh, Fahrenheit. Now that's not wind chill. On the weather, I said, yeah, it's fine down here in Minneapolis. You know, <laughs> like in the middle of the day, it's, you know, it's like 30. So he went to this little cafe in this small town. I mean, this is a small town, big factory, but a small town. I mean, this is a small town, big factory, but a small town. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, The Ukrainians in his neighborhood. So he goes, oh, yeah, I'll try the abortion. That was, uh, that, after that, I spent years trying to figure out how they made it. And it is still, still to, my, to this day, one of my most favorite soups. When You barely get the skin off. I don't want to take a lot of the skin off. Then I sit them in a bowl and let them cool, cool, and chop them up. And then I make the rest of the soup, but the beef broth and all that kind of stuff. And when I'm doing the assembly at the end, that's when I put the beets back. And that's real common up here in uh, Oh, my God, is that good. That is just crazy good. And then with a dollop of uh, sour cream on it and a dark red. You know, a black bread. Wow. I mean, that to us is uh, really, you know, November. Uh, in a bowl. And. But in soup like that. And they did blood test after, or and my folks had a huge. Or um, uh, sometimes be suggestions. Yeah, I don't. I'm just going to say it was a meal of.
Hello, yes, I've uh, been listening with uh, a watering mouth here. Um, but a while back for the Canadians here, you might remember uh, Don Genova used to be a CBC. Here you might in the uh, fall harvest. Uh, to the point where then when you pull them out, then you take the skin. Family kitchen. Um, uh, she was born in Ukraine, but as a child came over. Anyhow. You know, for those people who are listening, see, I know, but this is my Baba. She did it. And there was something about how it just, I think it's similar to what. Taste it. You can't taste it. It's just the final result. There was something. The wise wiser. Anyhow, give it a go. Hope it works. I, I hope somebody doesn't show up and egg your house. I think it makes sense. It makes sense to me. And so uh, it, yeah. So I always put tomatoes in it. Uh, usually canned tomato. believe it and again we don't do it in the summer we don't do it in the spring um but uh you start you know the snow starts flying in minnesota and that's one of the things i mean i'm hunting around for soup bones and uh, rutabaga and beets you know it's just it's just something we do and then i'm nagging my wife to make good bread she doesn't make a black bread so much but she makes a very good rye from her mother's uh, uh, and I will listen. Uh, 
uh, I have calls for canned tomato paste. So it's an easy way to kind of get a lot of Yes. So if you guys do it during the cooking and then also at the end, I believe you're Is, is one of those very popular things. I know for, for I mean, even just in our Hungarian, I know European growing It's one of my earliest. Um, but dill, yes. And my, I mean, and that carried on with my mom. My mom loved, carried on with my mom. My mom loved, loved to put dill in stuff. And it took me a long time to eat. lose sound and have to drop down and restart it every single time. I, I have no idea why. So that was what happened. Anyway, two things. Two, what was the second? Well, the first one is, um, oh, dill app is I, the recipe I had has lots of dill in it. And it, I think it really adds to it. But we have to have a Ukrainian say whether that's true. Lima beans in it. And I, I take a can of lima beans and, and, and you know, chop them up as small as I can and put them in. And it gives a real body to the soup, especially since I don't put meat in it. Um, I like it a lot. I have no idea if it's even remotely traditional, but uh, that's. Lima beans, sorry. <laughs> Lima beans are one of the most wonderful foods on the planet, Dave. Gee. It's, it's the texture. It's the, the most wonderful. And I don't mind them now, but it was a texture thing. Um, but, but realistically, what is in your borscht is whatever is ripe in the garden and whoever made the best borscht in your life is going to be your grandmother or your mom. Amos, go ahead. Yeah, just on this subject of lima beans, I, I hate lima beans also. Uh, I would go and visit my grandmother. Huh. I use cannellini. Okay. 
occasionally with him, Hungarian goulash. Uh, and she made a wonderful goulash. And I cannot find the recipe. I went. Something in it was. Dead one night. I Some distant memory was triggered in my brain. I think it was probably living. Oh, in the weeds, but I don't know if you have any feedback on goulash, but that's one of my favorite dishes. Goulash. Thanks for seeing me waving. I'll be real quick. Thanks for letting me bud the line. I had the same feelings of lima beans. I had them at a French restaurant in Beaumont, Alberta, last night. And they fixed a vegetable the way you always seem to fix of almost anything well see, exactly and that well you can fire it and then put sour cream Green board. Green board. Please do. Uh, yeah. Uh, so green borscht traditionally in, in Ukraine is made out of sorrel, which is kind of equi equivalent to And what was the other thing? Oh, yes, the other. I was trying to compare the bor the actual, the red borscht. Uh, uh, to I'm comparing it to minestrone soup, right? Because it, it doesn't have the uh, uh beach beets in it, so it's it's. As that's all I've got to say for now. <laughs> it's like me, I, you know, I agree, and I don't know why.
soup that I like to make. They're And so I found the solution, which was buying the little because I love the vegetable broth. And so I. Uh, there you, I'm, you know, I'm a pedantic. Pain in the ass about pronunciation, but I can't help my pain in the ass. And the other. I'm going to go uh, get to bed. Say hello to the boy for us there. There, Dave. I, I hear he is, he is a very happy guy. Dave. Yay, oh, yay, oh, yay. Um, It means uh, hear ye, hear ye in the Supreme Court, and you get to go in and watch oral arguments at the Supreme Court of the United States. The bailiff will come in at the Supreme Court of the United States. The bailiff will come in, and one of the first things they'll say is, oh, yay, oh, yay, oh, yay. A little bit of this at the end of the the day and Yes, of course. Yes, yes. Oh, God. Which in the summertime and you can make it all fresh.
Um, so I'm just trying to think. Yes, the other thing is I can um, um, DM you if you don't mind and DM you. Wonderful. Did I say Jaku? But we do. I know. It's rather fabulous. Um, because I know, I'm too busy. Life sniper. Well, thank you. Uh, could you please stop this food talk? It's six o'clock. In the morning, am I hungry? <laughs> In the morning. But if, uh, well. Uh, it's like one and a half centimeters, uh, sherry. <laughs> I love all things blue cheese. It's, uh, it's, it's Stilton or Rockford. Or whatever, uh, your your choice. Uh, or so like, <clears throat> uh, I think it's one hundred twenty grams of of cheese and about the same grams of of cheese and about the same amount of cream and about the same amount of tomato. Um, is this have for pasta for pasta? And then it's done. Um, so yeah. Fryer and basically my convection oven where my my oven on since before 2017. For two, well, for a few minutes. And that thing. Thank <laughs> you. 
och gott. That's me. <laughs> Hi. It's actually delish. But that's me. bean and then we'll talk borscht I could just be an AI really um <laughs> single step only two wasn't it so there. <laughs> um, ours is also very heavy uh, vegetable. It's very vegetable forward. And I have to say I made some vegetable forward. And I have to say I made some um, for a Polish person I was trying to impress. Beat bath water. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. See, this all started over an hour ago. With my new, <laughs> with my my new magical borscht recipe, it worked oh. really, really well. Yeah, you want to hear it? I went so far as to um, my, my mom is, uh, um, you know, she's my mom. Reds. it up in there. Mm 
Now, mm, how about that? Sounds good. I haven't tried bacon. Yeah. Now, mm. in mine yet. Oh God, you must. You can pronounce it. It's borscht. Borscht. Yep. It could never be the same borscht twice. I well, I mean, I'm no. You do that, but but I know there's always little. You. Do I'm, I'm wondering true. about borscht. Borscht in the Instapot. Mm. Mm, interesting. I don't have an Instapot. I was a slow cooker, and I'm not sure. Is essential, by the way. But what was his secret? And I'm big time crockpot, uh, brother. So, uh, previous reference, uh, I'm right in the camp. Previous reference, uh, I'm right in the camp. Uh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do some great northern beans. I'm going to do some. I'm going to. And some sugar. Uh, I'll, I'll ref find the recipe. Uh, I did buy a Ukrainian cookbook recently. Like so, I'll crack it open. Um, like so, I'll crack it open. Um, the the vinegar. I have a question about. Is there a particular kind of Unless we do have the bacon on hand, but what was interesting was, you know, forever ago, and I'm sure you remember our new friend, who's become my BFF, by the way. I love love this girl, um, Nastia. Um, she had us so. for dinner and she made borscht and it was or insult the cook and so I said well you know we do cook I just noticed that nobody who was from Vancouver was putting it. Yeah, I think Brand pointed something out here about the ketchup that we need to pay attention to. Because I think you're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the tomato, the vinegar, and the sugar. It is uh, all in one solution to those, those three three ingredients that that should be your, 
or can be in borscht. In borscht. I actually think he might be. You're right, but I'm, I mean, I know he's listening. I can't whisper it and pretend he doesn't hear me, but we're going to go. We're going ahead to and pretend he doesn't hear me, but we're going to go. We're going ahead to. will be I'm sure he won't mind <laughs> oh, he's saying I'm gonna lose let we'll about it as it happens um and, hey, uh, you're yeah. not that far away Prince you could you could show up as a Yeah, and we can obviously, without a doubt, make it a fundraiser. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's All right. Good. Okay, so Zero, go ahead. Head. Yay! Hey, thank you. Yes, so I just want to get by. Hey, thank you. Fat, fat, uh, pig fat, right? Good. You can. Uh... Hello, in Ukraine. In Ukrainian. You can put it into your, put like, uh, uh, boiled potatoes instead of uh, boiled potatoes instead of uh, um, uh, to smoke food in your um, smoker these days you can Right, so you can also smoke those things, and you can also put that into your borscht. Uh, pork meat in your supermarket. Kind of uh, and substitute for your um, uh, uh, the vinegars as well, and vinegars good in in borscht. Vinegar and sugar. I, I feel like I didn't leave the conversation. I did. I, I did leave the conversation. I had to go talk, talk to somebody else for the longest time, it seems like.
Like, and uh, we're right back to where I wanted to be, which was um, to ask B, which was um, to ask Prince. The thing is that kale that I'm talking about. Yeah, uh-huh, okay. That... ...been slightly um, blanched, I guess. In... James, what have you been doing? Anyway. Correctly, then that is, that is the same. get yourself some really fatty bacon it, it's a of course dave might be able to tell us about the worms we could get from it This, this trichinosis. Yeah. I correct. And like the basically the reason why. One of the veggies in there uh, is a, a is a superfood, which is the um is a superfood, which is the um country that yes. I can think that makes Lardo. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, so sallow, sallow, sallow. God, what the heck I was going to say about sallow. So sallow is, you know, is is basically lard. It's it's pig lard, pig fat, right? So how you consume it in small quantities along the side, like you can have it as a spread. Or you can um, use it in your mouth. Or you 
but it's all consumed in very small quantities. So, so it's, you know, it doesn't kill your heart, basically. Because you can cure it with garlic over the top of it, so you get the fat. Uh, that um, Porsche, by the way, I'm sorry, it's not. Is it a Jew? Is it a Jew? Yiddish, that's it, right. Yeah, so Yiddish pronunciation. So I pronounce it Borsh. Minestrone soup, that's the one. Yeah. So I say from up front. How I've been trying to discover. of information that I came across that Dave, you very person um, may want to uh, The late nineties, the reg <laughs> and chocolate sallow is a thing, and surprisingly, I I can imagine it. It, it sounds can imagine. In a, in a fancy restaurant. Let me give you some chocolate. Ah. So, um, uh, Delish, I think. It's uh, from. I'm glad you found it. Yeah. Uh, may I add something to that? If you say from.
since we're talking about sallow and borscht now, borscht, borscht, let's go to sallow. Hey, <clears throat> well, sallow is my uh, namesake there. So uh <laughs> joke because it's, I don't know, when, when I travel, travel in Ukraine, What are you what are you talking about? I said my my heart Eight. Uh, a better flavor um, there than it, uh, like I just haven't quite found it here. And maybe it's, you know, it's here, and maybe it's, you know, geographically where. Ship. So I wonder if my passport's expired. My US one. I could get a Canadian one while I'm there. My US one. I could get a Canadian one while I'm there. Well, because I, I think it's, it's a controlled it's pork contamination. Controlled pork products. They don't do it. They won't allow it. Meat products. You got busted by those dogs at the airport for sure. Controlled. Salo and Amazon. Salo and Amazon. That's the last and place I'm you want to. Mm. I wouldn't trust it. Yeah, my, well, my you know, I might don't have. spoil it. <laughs> don't spoil it. Really. I will bribe I you because you'll secretly do it. But just add it to her. Ooh. Hmm. Well, um, yeah.
sallow is the male pigs are castrated so the meat doesn't taste as strong according to his ukrainian taste is strong Male pigs, too much testosterone? I don't know. Um, let's, uh, let's go back. As it is, it is, it's a subtle difference. And I know also uh, there is um, a stress hormone in the impart a flavor on the meat that uh, look up temple grandin and uh watch even just the movie um watch even just 